Chapter One of White Dandy, a Horse's Story, a companion book to Black Beauty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. White Dandy, a Horse's Story, a companion book to Black Beauty by Velma Caldwell Melville. Chapter One. Master is Dr. Richard Wallace, and I am Dandy, the doctor's favorite horse, long-tried companion, and friend. Neither of us are as young as we once were, but time seems to tell less on us than on some others, though I have never been quite the same since that dreadful year that Master was out west. He often strokes my face and says, "'We're getting old, my boy, getting old, but it don't matter.' Then I see a far-away look in the kind blue eyes, a look that I know so well, and I press my cheek against his, trying to comfort him. I know full well what he is thinking about, whether he mentions it right out or not. Yes, I remember all about the tragedy that shaped both our lives, and how I have longed for intelligent speech, that I might talk it all over with him. He is sixty-two now, and I only half as old, but while he is just as busy as ever, he will not permit me to undertake a single hardship. Dr. Fred, his brother and partner, sometimes says, "'Don't be a fool over that old horse, Dick. "'He is able to work as any of us.' "'But the latter smiles and shakes his head. "'Dandy has seen hard service enough "'and earned a peaceful old age.' "'Fred sneers. "'He says he has no patience with Dick's nonsense. "'But then he was in Europe when the tragedy occurred, "'and besides I suppose it takes the romance and sentiment "'out of a man to have two wives, "'raise three bad boys, and bury one willful daughter, "'to say nothing of the grandson that he has on his hands now, "'and I might add further that he is a vastly different man from Dick anyway. "'It is a grand thing to spend one's life for others. "'That is what my master has done, and it is what we horses do. "'Of course he is looking forward to his reward,' but we are not expecting anything, though he insists that there will be a heaven for all faithful domestic animals. Fred says there is no Bible for it, but Dick says that they could not mention everything in one book. He says, too, that while he believes everything to be true that is in the Bible, at the same time he knows many things to be true that are not there. Then he tells about a good old minister, who, when asked to lend his influence in the organization of a society for the prevention of cruelty to animals, replied that if Paul had written a chapter on the subject, he would consider it worth his while to countenance the movement, but as he didn't, he must be excused. For the benefit of such men, Master says he wishes the Apostle had had time and inclination to write a chapter, and since he did not, with due reverence for Paul, it would have suited him better, and met a nineteenth-century need closer, if he had omitted suggestions on ladies' toilets, and dealt a few of his sledgehammer blows at the man who oppresses the defenceless. Of course I know nothing about such things myself, but Dr. Dick has always had a fashion of talking all sorts of things to me, and I have a retentive memory. But I must begin my story, for I have set out to give you a history of Master and I, and, incidentally, of many another man and beast. I will begin shortly after the tragedy. Maybe before I get through I will tell you about that, but today I do not feel equal to it. Poor master. Well, he came into my stall, where I had literally shivered with terror ever since that dreadful morning four days before, and throwing his arms about my neck, burst into tears. A long while he sobbed there, and then growing calmer he began caressing me and said, "'Dandy boy, you are going home with me, to live with me while I live, to walk beside my coffin, and to be shot beside my grave, if so be you outlive me. Sad words, but they were a comfort to me, feeling as I did. Presently the boy came in, and groomed me until my snowy coat shone like silk. "'I hate to part with you, Dandy, for a fact I do,' he said, standing off and looking me over. "'But then ye'd a gone anyhow, I suppose.' Then he put a halter on me, and led me out to where the doctor's horses were standing, hitched to a buggy, and tied me fast to the back. All the folks came out of the house, and surely they cried harder than on either of those other days, but the doctor, with his lips white and set close together, hurried into the buggy, and, with a backward nod, drove off. I glanced back and neighed good-bye, then took up my journey with a heavy heart. 
I wanted to go, and yet I wanted to stay. Certainly it was not enlivening to have to watch my master's agony all that weary seventy miles to his home. Of course we stopped overnight, and my first night it was away from home. I assure you that I felt lonely and wretched enough. "'Give all my horses the best of care,' master said to the hostler, "'especially the white one.' The man promised and led us away. "'Don't suppose they're any better than other nags,' he muttered, the minute we were out of hearing, and he took us to the pump, tired and heated as we were, and gave us all the water we could drink. "'What would Dr. Dick say?' Queen, one of the span of bays, said, as we turned away. Of course the man did not understand, but thinking she was calling for more water, he pumped another pailful and offered it to her. In surprise she turned her head aside, which so angered him that he dashed the whole of the water right on to her. Then he led us into dark, dirty stalls, roughly removed the harness from the bays, and threw us some hay. When he was gone, at least we could not hear him, Queen said, "'I am all of a shiver. I believe it was the cold water inside and out. Dear me, I wish Master would come out.' "'So do I,' said Julie. "'One thing is sure, we will have to stand up all night. I can never lie down in this filthy place.' "'I don't think I could if I wanted to,' responded Queen. "'I am tied so short.' "'Meanwhile I was nosing the hay, but it smelled so musty, and something in it tickled my nostrils. "'Presently I asked them if they could eat it. "'Oh, yes,' Julie answered. "'If you are going to be a doctor's horse, you'll get worse than this.' "'Being pretty hungry, I nibbled away at it until a groan from Queen startled me. "'Ain't you any better?' queried Julie.' "'No, I am shaking so I can hardly stand. "'How I do wish I had a blanket.' "'Wonder he don't see to rubbing us down,' I said. "'Rubbing us down?' Julie spoke with scorn. "'Unless Master comes out himself, as he generally does, "'there'll be no rubbing down to-night. "'About daylight they'll come around with an old curry-comb "'and all but take the skin off us, "'along with the mud that will be formed out of the sweat and dust "'that ought to be rubbed off to-night.' "'Oh, I wish Master would come,' moaned Queen. "'I am almost burning up now.' "'Got fever,' remarked her mate, "'who seemed to have been around the world a good deal "'and grown used to everything. "'After what seemed an age, a light flashed into the barn, "'and two strange horses were tied in the next stalls. "'The same man led them. "'After throwing them some hay, he came into my stall. "'Here, you fool, why don't you eat your hay, not muss over it?' he cried angrily, pushing it together with one hand, while with the other he dealt me a blow across the nose. It was the first blow that I had ever received, and it hurt me in more ways than one. Just then a boy came in with a peck measure of oats. "'There ain't none of these critters touched their hay hardly, and their boss has gone to bed sick, so I guess we'll economize on the oats till morning.' "'All right.' "'Humph,' said Julie. But Queen groaned and I felt like it. Before morning of that wretched night I lay down. I could not help it. I was so tired, hungry, and sad. Sure enough, by daylight, or lantern light in that windowless barn, the man and boy were at us with curry-combs, as if we had had no more feeling than barn doors. Then we each had a meagre portion of oats. Julie and I ate ours readily enough, but poor Queen was too ill. When the man noticed this he swore a little, then lengthened her halter-strap, and ordered the boy to scatter some straw over the filth in all our stalls. By and by Master came out, looking wan and haggard in the dim light. "'Poor girl,' he said tenderly, running his fingers along the edge of Queenie's jaw to the pulse. "'Mercy, Queenie, what a pulse! Ninety! Then he questioned the man as to his care of us, but never a word of truth he got in reply. But we could not tell.' "'Lead her out into the daylight,' Dr. Dick ordered, adding, "'Haven't you a lot or yard where all my horses can be turned out for a while?' The man demurred, but Master soon brought the landlord, and we were taken out into the sunlight. So busy was the former administering a dose of aconite to Queen that he did not at first notice me, 
but when he did an angry ejaculation escaped his lips as he pointed to my side. I was astonished, too, when I saw instead of my spotless coat a great yellow stain. "'Is that the kind of beds you provide?' he cried, turning to the landlord. "'I am sure there seemed to be clean straw in all the stalls,' the latter replied. "'I'll ask the man.' "'No need,' answered the doctor curtly. "'I am the one to blame for trusting any man to take care of these good servants who cannot speak for themselves.' It was almost noon before we started, and then the bays walked every step of the way. Just before leaving, the span of horses that came in after us the night before were brought out, one of them limping painfully. The owner unconcernedly seated himself in his buggy and took up the lines. The doctor spoke of the animal's lameness. "'Oh, that is nothing. Jerry is always lame when he first starts, and nearly all of the rest of the time for that matter,' he added." as if it were a good joke. "'Why don't you have the trouble investigated?' "'Oh, I don't know. Never thought much about it. He's an old horse.' And with this he drove off. Dr. Fred's first wife and her two boys were waiting to— but you can't understand what for yet. There were not so many railroads and lines of telegraph then, and no intimation of the news we brought had reached her. She cried and petted Dr. Dick as if he had been her own child. She put her arms about my neck and kissed me, too, making me think of other arms and other kisses. Ah, me! That Mrs. Fred was a lovely woman, more fit for Dr. Dick than his brother. The Wallaces lived in the small country village of K, and controlled a large practice. The brothers were ambitious, but had started poor, and not until the year before had they felt that either could spend a few months abroad. Fred was the elder, and there were other reasons why Dick preferred to go later, so it happened that the former was the last of the family for me to know. The Wallace barn was a large frame building, warm in winter, cool from having perfect ventilation in summer, and well lighted. Dr. Dick would have no hay mowed to be dropped into the mangers, nor would he have it stored directly above us all. He insisted that the dust would inevitably sift down and be the cause of various diseases of the eye, ear, throat, and lungs. He was particular about the stalls and feed boxes, too. He said it was a shame for an animal with a low body and short neck to be expected to take any comfort eating from a box put up for a high horse with a long neck. He had each stall fitted up with reference to its occupant, nor would he allow us to be put where we did not belong. Queen and Julie were regular long, clean-limbed roadsters, and their feed-boxes were much higher than mine. I am of heavy build, with short legs and neck. The first time Dr. Fred looked me over, when Dr. Dick was absent, he remarked, "'A pretty horse for a doctor, slow and clumsy. No endurance.'" End of chapter 1 Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on Wednesday, January 15th, 2014, in San Diego, California. Chapter 2 of White Dandy, A Horse's Story, a companion book to Black Beauty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Irie White Dandy, A Horse's Story, A Companion Book to Black Beauty by Velma Caldwell Melville Chapter 2 Besides the bays, the Wallaces owned one other horse, Old Ross, a somewhat worn and battered veteran who entertained me for hours at a time when we were standing alone in the shady pasture or in the barn, with tales of what he had seen, known, and experienced. "'You look like a nice young fellow,' he said on the second day of my arrival. "'But I'd rather be myself, all battered up as I am, than you, for I have the satisfaction of knowing that I can't live many years longer, and you may happen to suffer through a long lifetime yet.' "'Why?' I said. "'Is it so bad as that to live?' I have always had a good time. Yes, it is very bad to live if you are owned by some people. Of course I am happy and contented here, 
only I know I shall be sold by and by. I am about worn out, and Dr. Fred said before he went away that I was getting too stiff for a doctor's horse. But my master is never going to sell me. How do you know that? He says I am going to live with him always and be shot on his grave. Well, Dr. Dick is an exception among men, but he don't always get his way. The season following my coming to K proved to be a never-to-be-forgotten one. Cholera raged for many weeks, and I had to take my share of the work, especially as Queen was not strong. She was never as well again before that night in the livery stable. She took cold easily and could not endure fatigue. Days and nights together Master never rested and scarcely ate anything, but in one sense it was a good thing. It helped him forget. One day he had had the bays out since just after midnight, and Ross had fallen terribly lame the day before. So when a call came for him to go a dozen or more miles in a pouring rain, he was obliged to saddle me. "'Poor little dandy,' he said. "'Your legs are too short for such a journey, but it is life or death to the mother of seven little ones.' "'That was enough for me.' My legs might be short, but they were strong, and though the doctor was heavy, I felt equal to the task. I started off on a swift canter, but Master drew rein, telling me to husband my strength for the last half of the way. It had long been dark when we arrived, inky dark, too, with no cessation of the rainfall. A trembling hand held out the lantern while a hollow voice fairly sobbed, "'I'm afeard you're too late, doctor. My woman is sinking fast.' Now see here, my man, you take good care of my noble little horse here, and I'll pull the wife through, or fail doing my best. By the uncertain light of the lantern, I saw that I was being tied in a sort of shed. My saddle was removed, but its place was soon supplied by a stream of water that trickled through a hole in the roof. Move which way I would, the leak was directly over my back. The man laid some newly cut grass across some poles barely within my reach and went away. All the while I was aware that the place had another occupant, though I could see nothing. Presently a horse's voice in the darkness asked if I had come far. From the first tone I noticed a sadness, but I replied to the question, adding that I would rather be out of doors than in this leaky place. Oh, she said, this ain't bad now. "'But it is a dreary place in winter, with the snows drifting in and the wind whistling through.' "'I was too much surprised to answer at first, and in a minute she gave a long, piteous whinny. "'Whom are you calling?' I asked. "'My baby, my pretty little roan colt. "'They took him from me last week and have not brought him back. "'It seems as if my heart must break. "'We were never separated an hour before.' and I don't see how he will get along. My baby, oh, my baby! I expressed my pity for her, and she said it did her good to have someone to talk to. Oh, it is a dreadful thing to be a mother, loving your offspring as much as human mothers do, and yet be speechless and helpless, she moaned. They tied me in here and drove Selim into a corner and caught him, I jerked and neighed until my master kicked me and bade me shut my head. By this time the others had got Selim out, and I could hear him calling to me. His voice grew fainter and fainter, and then all was still. I suppose your master sold him. Ross, the old horse at our place, says he was taken from his mother and sold. Oh, me! If colts must be taken from their mothers in that way— why can't they get us used to the separation by degrees, not tear us apart without a moment's warning or word of farewell? Why can't they? I repeated, then added, But I guess your master is getting pay now for his cruelty. His wife is almost dying with cholera, and my master says there are seven little children. I shall certainly pity the children if they are deprived of a mother's care. "'but they will feel no worse than little Selim does.' "'After a while, Dr. Dick came out to the shed. "'I suppose the rain had ceased by that time, "'at least the stream of water on my back had, "'but I was standing in some sort of filth "'with the mud hardening on my legs. 
A long while he scraped and rubbed my legs and back, then turned me out into a little pasture. "'It will be better than this dirty place, Dandy,' he said, and it was. It was just growing gray in the morning when a man rode past the pasture on a horse that fairly swayed from side to side. He was so exhausted, and blood and foam poured from his mouth and nostrils. In a minute more Dr. Dick was calling me. "'Likely you'll have a time to catch the colt,' the owner of the premises was saying as I came up. The doctor laughed. "'Why, that's queer,' the man said. "'I can never get near the old mare even when she's out.' "'Well, sir,' replied Master, looking very serious, "'I would be ashamed to treat a dumb animal so badly that it would fear to come at my call. My horses know that I am their friend.' and that though I may have to work them hard, I will not require more of them than they can do, and that they can trust me in all things. Then he stroked my face, and I put my cheek against his. Dandy and I love each other, he added. Then he went for the saddle and bridle. My companion of the evening before was still neighing pitifully, and Master inquired the cause. Sir, if your wife or any of your children die— he said severely, when the other had told about the colt. Just remember that you deserve it for having no regard for the feelings of a dumb mother. The God who noteth the sparrow's fall will measure unto you as you measure unto the helpless. There is a merciful and humane way of dealing in all these matters. If I were in your place, I'd send one of the boys to bring that colt where its mother can see it for a day, and then let her watch it go away." Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. We now joined the other man standing beside his heaving horse at the gate. Follow at your leisure. That poor beast is well nigh done for. I will hurry on and do all I can, Dr. Dick said to the stranger, whose sister had been attacked by the epidemic, and away we flew. My training had all been for the saddle, and whether built right or not, I was at home under it. We turned in at the Wallace Gateway just forty-eight hours after going out of it. "'How did the colt stand it?' was the hired man's first query. "'Dandy is a jewel, Bob,' Master replied heartily. "'A perfect saddle-horse, and with ambition and sense enough for a dozen horses.' And thus began my actual experience as a doctor's horse, and from that time on our names were continually associated together— first by the family, and finally by the whole town and neighborhood. I remember one small boy, coming in haste for the doctor, breathlessly announced that he had come for Dick and Dandy. I was soon trained to drive in a sulky, and grew to like it better than the saddle, only that I could not hear quite as well what the doctor said to me, in common conversation, as we traveled along. The news of the epidemic brought Dr. Fred home some little time before he intended coming, but his coming brought no additional happiness to the stables, whether it did to the house or not. He rushed about everything, spoke in a loud, confusing tone, issued one order only to countermand it by another, used profane language, and drank whiskey. "'We've had our good time.' Ross remarked significantly, and Julie gave an acquiescent snort. Meanwhile, a new blacksmith had bought out the old one in K, and Dr. Dick was wondering if the former was a bungler. Ross did not get over his lameness, and Master had had his shoes removed, and turned him out into the pasture. End of chapter 2《Chapter Three of White Dandy A Horse's Story A Companion Book to Black Beauty》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Irie White Dandy A Horse's Story A Companion Book to Black Beauty by Velma Caldwell Melville. Chapter Three the epidemic abated with the early frosts, and the Wallace brothers had a little more leisure. Dr. Dick was thin and pale, but assured Mrs. Fred, when she worried about it, that he would soon pick up. One day Dr. Fred drove home with Julie and a new mate. He had traded Queen off. The new horse was named Kit, 
and she did not match Julie in color as Queen had. Mrs. Fred cried. She said it seemed just like trading one of the family off, and she could not endure it. Dr. Dick looked dark, but only added, I regret it exceedingly. You are a pair of fools, growled Fred, and I have had enough of this nonsense. A horse is no more than any other piece of property, and I'll trade every one on the place if I please. You dasn't trade Dandy, cried the eldest of the family hopefuls saucily. He's Uncle Dick's. Bob unhitched the new mare and led her into Queen's stall. How we all felt! But before her harness was fairly off, the unwelcome stranger lay flat on her side, her whole frame quivering and her four legs stretched straight out. Bob yelled, and both men hurried back to the barn. Fred stood staring helplessly, and then I surmised what I afterwards learned to be true— that with all his headstrong swagger he was as helpless as a child when things went wrong. "'Poor thing,' said my master pityingly. "'It is some disease of the foot.' He examined her feet as well as he could, and then sent for the smith to remove her shoes. "'There's nothing particular wrong with these shoes,' the smith said. "'But her feet are in a fearful condition from wrong shoeing and senseless cutting and rasping in the past.' I am ashamed of our craftsmen. Blacksmiths are, as a class, the most unenlightened, pig-headed men in the world. I can trace the history of this poor beast's sufferings right down. First, some man, with more theory than sense, took her feet, perfect from the hand of the Creator, who, knowing enough to make a horse, knew enough to make its feet, and with his knife trimmed the frog and thinned the sole until he could feel it yield when he pressed on it. This is an important part of the average farrier's creed. Next, I suppose, he opened the heel, and then proceeded to nail on a shoe, regardless of whether it fitted or not. The chances for its fitting would be about equal to yours or mine if we shut our eyes in a shoe store and picked out a pair of boots at random. As the shoe didn't fit the foot, the foot must be made to fit the shoe, so down came the ever-ready rasp, and the business was finished up speedily. From that hour, doubtless years ago, this poor creature has suffered untold torture. Meantime, dozens of bunglers have tried their knives, rasps, and hammers on mangled feet. God forgive them. I don't know, put in Dr. Dick, whether one ought to pray for blessings or curses on such men. Well, such things will go on until owners of horse-flesh inform themselves on this subject, and then insist upon having the work done right. I often think, as I watch team after team pass along the street, of the dumb agony, unguessed at, moving by. Two-thirds of our horses suffer daily with their feet. Most cases of stumbling are from diseased feet induced by improper shoeing, and yet men are forever jerking and cursing the stumbling horse. "'You are a man after my own heart,' Dr. Dick said in his frank, hearty way. "'Just see these nails,' went on the farrier presently, "'as large again as they need or ought to be, "'and look at her hooves all picked to pieces with the things. "'Well, Dr. Fred can't drive his trade in many a week.' When the latter came out again and learned the true condition of things, he began to bluster about the man who had cheated him, and swore he'd make him trade back, but he never tried it. During the weeks that poor Kit was under treatment, he used Julie in the sulky, and Dr. Dick rode me, excepting once in a while they drove Julie and Ross in the buggy. Fred wanted to drive me with Julie, but my master said no most emphatically. "'I will not be guilty of such barbarity,' he declared. "'And it is barbarous to drive a short-legged heavy horse with a long-legged one. "'But despite his care, I was still to have a trial of it. "'Perhaps I ought to mention that the first thing they did for Kit "'was to soak her feet by having her stand in tubs of warm water. "'When the dry cramped horn and stuff was thoroughly softened,' They poulticed them with boiled turnip occasionally, and kept her standing most of the time in moist sawdust. In the day she ran out in the pasture if she liked, and all the time her feet were greased. 
In about two months the humane smith put some shoes on her, but they were very unlike those worn by the rest of us. They were made on purpose. He said they must be changed often. Then the Wallaces sold her to a farmer, after explaining the case to him, at least Dr. Dick did. He said she would be all right for farm work, but could never stand fast driving. Imagine our joy not long afterward when Master came home one night with Julie in the sulky and Queen tied at the back. Dear Queen, how her eyes wandered to every familiar spot, and how she neighed with gladness. Ross and I answered lustily, and even Grim the dog barked and capered in welcome. I have been so homesick, she said. Oh, so dreadfully homesick, but I couldn't tell it. Again and again I opened my mouth and tried to articulate just the one word, don't, when Dr. Fred was making the trade, but of course it only ended in what people call a whinny. If they would only try putting themselves in our places, maybe they could guess at what we are trying to say. Speaking of Grimm, a little way back, reminds me that I should have introduced him before. Strange I could neglect to mention anything belonging to my master— or, if not really belonging, indebted to him for home and existence. It all happened before I came, but the others told me of it. Dr. Dick had gone to a neighboring city on business, and while walking along the street one day was startled by the cry of, Mad Dog! Turning quickly, he saw a long, slender brown dog running towards him, pursued by a band of hoodlums with stones and clubs. Everybody cleared the way without question, even the policeman. In one glance he recognized, not a mad dog, but an abused, frightened creature running for its life. He had thick driving gloves on, and acting on the impulse of the moment, as well as on the impulse uppermost with him to defend the helpless, he turned and clasped his hands about the panting animal's neck, at the same moment speaking gently and reassuringly to it. On pressed the mob, scattering and surrounding him, half a dozen clubs and knives raised to dispatch the dog. "'Fools, this dog is not mad. Get out and let me manage him,' he roared. A couple of policemen ventured nearby this time, and he appealed to them to disperse the crowd. I heard Master say myself that the dog looked up into his face with eyes of human intelligence, from which thanks and trust plainly shone out. Of course the dog wasn't mad, but somebody had started the story, and Ross says give a horse, cow, dog, cat, or any creature that cannot speak for itself a bad name, and it is worse than killing it outright. Well, Master fed and petted the half-dead creature, and finally brought him home to Chet and Carm, Dr. Fred's boys. Grimm was quite a character in his way, and much respected, inasmuch as he gave warning once in the night when the house was on fire, and saved the little daughter of a neighbor when a vicious cow was about to gore her. Dr. Dick says that either here or hereafter all kind deeds shall be rewarded. And unkind ones, too, he usually adds. As the nights became cold, Grim left the rug on the front porch and came to the barn. I invited him to sleep in my manger, and soon we became intimate friends. One night, when the other horses, that is, the bays, were out, and Ross so far off that our talk would not disturb him, I asked Grimm about his early life. "'Well,' he said, "'there is not much to tell. I cannot remember when I did not live in the pretty brown cottage on South Street, in the city where Dr. Dick found me. My constant playmate was a little girl with sunny curls and a sweet face. Ruthie, her name was.' They were all kind to me there, feeding and petting me continually. But one day something happened, I don't know what, but Ruthie and her mother went off in a strange carriage early in the afternoon. I watched for their return, but it came on dark, and Master came home, and still they weren't there. I trotted around after him until he picked up a letter that lay on the dining table. I noticed that his fingers trembled, and he grew very white as he read it. At last he began rushing madly about the room, crushing the letter in his hands and fairly hissing. Suddenly he dropped on his knees beside me and, gathering me in his arms, sobbed out, "'I am going to find Ruthie, Brownie,' I was called Brownie then, "'and maybe I'll—' But he did not finish the sentence. 
He was in the bedroom a while. Then he came out, dressed for traveling, told me to go out, went out himself, locked the door, and was soon lost to sight in the darkness. I could not understand, but felt that some dreadful thing had happened. I did not feel hungry that night, nor did I sleep much. In the morning I dug up a buried bone and made a very poor breakfast. Night found me still more lonely and hungry. Thus many days passed, and I was obliged to beg my meals at the neighbors over the way. Such a sad life as I led, lying most of the time on the porch guarding the shut door, I felt myself responsible. Toward fall a strange man and woman came, unlocked the door, and took possession, but they would have nothing to say to me, only to bid me be gone. It all seemed worse yet. While the house was alone I felt that I had a home, but now I was ordered from even my old rug. No wonder that I got poor and thin and people thought that I acted strangely. I heard the woman tell a neighbor that she and her husband had rented the house all furnished till spring. She grew more unkind to me every day and was always wondering what that horrid dog hung skulking around for. Once her husband told her that it was because it was my home. Well, she said, it ain't now and I'll have him shot or I'll scald him if he don't keep away. I'm sure she was the one to start the story about my being mad. Well, I was saved by Dr. Dick, and I love him and all that belongs to him as only a grateful dog can love. What a terribly cruel thing for your people to leave you there unprovided for, I cried indignantly. Yes, it was cruel, but I am sure some great trouble came to them, else they never would have done it. Anyway, it is no uncommon thing for folks to leave their pets that way. I have known many instances. While I lived in the city, an old lady in the next street went away to spend the winter, leaving her pet cat to forage for itself. The poor creature was dreadful shy, but I used to see her sit day in and day out on the cold, icy step, looking piteously up at the door and waiting for it to be opened. One very cold morning I noticed her there, and thought I would carry over a piece of meat. She always ran away when she saw me, but I thought I could lay it down and she would come back to it. Imagine my surprise when she never moved. At last I stood beside her, and then I saw she was dead, starved and frozen, her sightless eyes still looking up at the doorknob. "'How terrible!' I said. "'Yes.' And some other time I will tell you of other things I knew about there. But we have had enough for one night. Hark! I hear Master's bells. End of chapter 3
that he had just found out that a span of horses had stood in an old shed belonging to a saloon for two whole days and nights the week before with neither food nor water the owner was on a protracted spree dr dick was furious he never shows anger excepting under such circumstances as this he immediately wrote two letters one to the saloon keeper and the other to the man who had neglected the team boldly signing his name and warning them not to repeat or be party to such an offence again further than this between himself and the smith the sheds and alleys of the little town were closely watched several times in daylight when master knew that animals had stood for hours unfed and unwatered he would send bob to untie them and bring them to our barn there they would be rubbed and cared for then returned to their post and as fast as our blankets grew shabby he found some poor shivering beast whose back needed them one day while bob was unhitching a sorry-looking horse that had stood unprotected and uncared for for eight hours in a cold wind the owner rushed out of the saloon and began a tipsy tirade threatening to have the youth arrested for horse stealing if he dared to take the creature afoot bob came home to report dr fred bade him mind his own business and let other people's property alone dr dick told him that so long as a man did not abuse his property he proposed to let it alone but that when a living creature was being imposed on and abused that he had a right a god-given right to interfere so long as he did not injure the man or make him poorer fred had been drinking a little himself and becoming furious shook his fist in master's face and called him hard names the later without replying turned away and bade bob attend to the work at home supposing that he had won the day fred strutted off to the house no sooner was he indoors than Dr. Dick was striding down the street, and in ten minutes more the half-frozen subject of the trouble was being rubbed and fed in the stall to the right of mine. When the animal was finishing her oats, the owner came swearing in. Expecting something of the kind, Master was on hand. I can't begin to tell you what he said to that poor, drunken wretch, but it was a sermon, a temperance lecture, a humane plea all in one. When the fellow went away, he seemed pretty well sobered and ashamed, and even thanked Master for his kindness and promised to use the blanket given and go right straight home. "'Dr. Dick is a queer un,' Bob remarked to a neighbor lad, to whom he related the incident later. "'Mokes folks let on they ain't got no right to meddle with what they call other people's affairs, but I guess it's more cause they're too lazy and cowardly. He says he ain't afeard of devil nor man, but is afeard of doing wrong. Now ain't he queer?' "'I should snicker,' replied the other emphatically, not looking in the least inclined to do so, though. I suppose it was his way of saying yes. "'What do you think?' In spite of all the family could say, Dr. Fred sold Ross toward spring. I shall never forget the look of sadness on the poor fellow's eyes, and the mournful whinny he gave as he turned his head at the barn door and looked back at the empty stall. It happened that the man who bought him came for him when both doctors, the bays, and Bob were away. The little boys were playing in the barn. "'I've come for the old horse I bought,' he said. "'It's that un,' Chet answered, pointing to Ross, so we knew there was no mistake. I called after him as long as I could make him hear. He said he wished he could die, that there was never a moment that he was not in pain. He had straight halt, I think and Dr. Fred said he was getting less worth every day, and after a while would not be fit to travel. Master said better put him out of his misery, but then he belonged to Fred, so that settled it. Before I forget it, I want to tell of a former mate of Ross that he used to talk about. His name was Billy. They belonged to a very passionate man, who, when he became excited, would pound them unmercifully. Some little thing went wrong one day, nothing that the team was to blame for, and the man dealt Billy several blows on the head with inch pin. He staggered, and the man, fearing he had killed him, cooled down and quickly brought some water, giving him some to drink and pouring some on his head. This seemed to help him, and he worked on all day. Ross said the animal woke him, but receiving no answer, only groans and queer sounds. By this time, Billy had knocked down the thin partition between their stalls, and was dealing him some terrible blows with his heels. He crept as far away as he could, and longed for daylight. When it came, Billy was on the floor bruised, exhausted, and almost choked from retching of the halter strap. As far as he could reach in every direction, things were demolished. 
The owner seemed very much frightened when he came out, and at once put a boy on Ross to go for a veterinary. The latter, after an examination, asked if any blow had been given on the head. Shamefacedly, the master acknowledged the truth. "'Well,' replied the other, "'if you got any satisfaction out of it at the time, that is all you ever will get. This horse is ruined. There is inflammation of the brain. He may get better, but I think he will have one or two more spells of delirium, and then die. It is something similar to mad staggers. They bled the horse. I am so glad that the barbarous notion of bloodletting is a thing of the past, and put some cloths wet in cold water on his head. He seemed to get better, and was put to work again. But a week or so later, while ploughing corn in the hot sun, another attack came on, and rearing, he fell backward, narrowly missing, crushing his master. When better again, he was taken some distance from home, and sold. Some two years passed, and Ross himself had changed hands. When one day, as he was standing tied to a post before a country grocery, a weary, shabby-looking horse near him asked if he did not know him. "'It's Billy's voice,' said Ross. "'But this never can be Billy.' "'But it is,' said the other mournfully. "'Or what is left of him? I'm pretty used up.' Then he told how he had passed from hand to hand, and something of his bodily sufferings. He had been experimented on by every quack in the country, but each augmented his torture. One man, he said, helped me. He was kind and gentle, never yelled at me, oh, how I wish they knew how noise hurts my head, and always gave me water every hour through the day, and left it where I could reach it at night. Sometimes cold water throws off a fit. He used to work me early and late in the day, but through the hot part kept me in the shade. He also used cold pads on my head and gave me pills of belladonna one or two a day when my head was hot and my eyes red. He sometimes gave aconite, too, and when I'd been in the sun, glycium was a remedy. I think I might have recovered had he lived, but when we had been there four months, he died. And soon I was sold and abused worse than ever. Strange how we dumb brutes can linger and suffer. Ross never saw him again, and often wondered if he still lived. Dr. Fred bought a new horse, a gay fellow, with wicked eyes and a temper to match. His name was Prince. He was well-built, dark iron-gray, about eight years old. "'He's mighty nervous,' commented Bob. "'Just acts as if he expects me to hit or kick him every time I come round him, and jerks his head back if I so much as put my hand on the manger. He's ugly, too, for he lays his ears back and shows his teeth mighty frequent.' Our stalls were so far apart that we could not talk much so I knew almost nothing about him, until one morning Bob put me in one sleigh for Master and Prince in another for Dr. Fred. Such a time as the boy had to get that horse hitched up. He would not stand, and was rearing and jerking the whole time. "'Ain't he a beauty?' cried Dr. Fred proudly. "'Most too much of a horse for you to manage, ain't he, Bob? "'Here, Prince, be quiet, sir.' The animal quieted a little, and looked at him. See, he minds me. He must use authority in your tone when— But the sentence never was finished, for just at that moment the beauty reached out and caught his admirer by the shoulder, lifting him off his feet at the first shake. Then there was a scene. That brute shook his master as a cat would a rat, despite the frantic blows dealt by Fred's left hand and Bob's vigorous fists. Dr. Dick was in the office, but the noise— drew him barely in time to see his brother flung a dozen feet or more into a snowdrift. I am afraid that Master smiled, it seemed to me, anyway. But he, of course, rushed to the rescue. No sooner did Fred get on his feet than he flew at that horse with the butt of a riding whip, raining down the blows alike on the face, over the head, anywhere he could strike in his wild anger. "'I'll teach you, you wretch! I'll make you suffer!' and kindred remarks shot explosively from his mouth. Master, white to the lips, now interfered, but only conquered by superior muscle, for Fred was crazed with pain and anger. Of course, had he been a horse, he would have had to endure ten times as much suffering and injustice quietly, but he was a man, and bent on revenge. I do not think Prince did right. Indeed, he did very wrong. But he had far less than most horses had to endure. Oft times I had seen Dr. Fred strike Ross, or the bays for nothing at all. Simply, he was out of sorts, so I could not pity him much. 
Don't call the entire neighborhood together, said Master. You're acting very silly. Go in the house and have Nanny bathe your shoulder, and I will try the new horse a while. Bob, you may put Dandy back. After considerable more fuss, Fred limped off to the house, and Dr. Dick stepped to Prince's head. Back went the latter's ears, and his lips quivered. Calmly, Master looked him in the eye, then began stroking his face and talking to him. He gradually quieted down, but his glance was both treacherous and distrustful. End of chapter 4 Recording by Beth Joy Detroit, Michigan Chapter 5 of White Dandy, A Horse's Story, a companion book to Black Beauty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Kleiser, San Antonio, Texas. White Dandy, A Horse's Story, a companion book to Black Beauty, by Velma Caldwell Melville. Chapter 5 This was the beginning of turbulent times between master and servant. When my doctor drove Prince, all went well. But from that morning, Fred and he were always in a row. Many a time have I been reluctantly turned over to the elder brother to keep peace and save Prince from a pounding. On sunny days, as it came on spring, we horses used to be turned into the pasture for a little run and on one of these occasions Prince spoke of his hatred for his master. "'But you were to blame in the first place,' I said. "'Well,' he answered, "'I suppose I am ugly. I never thought so, though, till I came here and saw you and the bays. But it's no wonder. When I was a tiny colt, I was badgered and tormented by boys until I learned to use my teeth and heels in self-defense. The harder I fought, the more they teased me. Then, when the men came to break me, I was naturally wild and unmanageable, and they yelled and whipped me until I was fairly beside myself with fear. I learned one thing, and that was that by kicking and biting I could conquer some of them. Had I been treated with quiet, kind firmness, I might have had a different history. I'm not the only otherwise fine horse that has been ruined in the training. Everybody has been hard and cruel with me, and I've just made up my mind to fight it out and die game. What's the fun or comfort in living, anyhow? You give your time, strength, and life for the little you can eat, when you happen to get that, and if you live past your usefulness, you're turned out to starve and freeze. Men are working for themselves and laying by for old age, but we who work much harder have nothing but starvation and death in anticipation. Where I lived last, there was an old horse that had outlived her usefulness. She had raised fifteen sons and daughters, worth none of them less than eight hundred dollars when four years old, and had scarcely missed a day's work since she was two years old. But we'll suppose that she had worked only three hundred days in the year, and put it at the low valuation of fifty cents a day. Ought she not to have had something laid by for old age? Well, at thirty-four she was worn out, and Master said he couldn't afford to feed a horse that couldn't work, so the hired man led her out in the woods with the gun over his shoulder. He put her in position, stepped off, and fired. The ball cut through her cheek and passed on. Frightened and hurt, she turned and tried to run away. He called her, and, and do you believe it? She was so used to obeying that she turned back and came toward him, stopping when he told her to even though the gun was again pointed in her face. That time he shot her dead. I've seen so much of such work, no wonder I'm ugly. Before we went into the barn, Prince admitted that he liked Dr. Dick. Had I had him for my master, I might not have hated and distrusted men so. I'm as gentle as a lamb with women and little girls. In the years since, I have found that the vicious horse with bad habits is universally the one that was spoiled in its early training. I wish people were more patient and could understand that colts need only gentleness and firmness. From my earliest babyhood I was taught by loving hands to wear a halter and be led. I early learned to obey and not to fear. When once we horses learn a thing, we almost cannot forget it. Then, if we're only taught good things, 
were all right. It had not grown quite warm enough for Grimm to go back to his bed on the porch, so he still slept in my manger, when we were startled one night by an unfamiliar step on the barn floor. Stealthily, someone flashed a lantern into my stall, and a strange hand rested on my back. The next moment Grimm had flung himself out of that box and had his teeth fastened in the intruder's leg. A volley of muttered curses burst from the man's lips as he wildly tried to kick and pound his adversary off. With one blow of my left foot, I smashed his lantern all to pieces, and then began neighing as loud as I could, in which the other horses immediately joined. All the while a terrible struggle was going on upon the floor. It seemed an age before Master, closely followed by Bob, came, but I suppose it was only a few minutes. In the dim light they could just make out two figures rolling about, but Bob's lantern hung right by the door, and it was the work of a moment to light it, and of another for Dr. Dick's strong arms to pinion the horse thief. Poor Grimm was pretty badly gashed up from the pocket knife in the man's hand, but he had proven himself faithful. The man was soon handed over to Justice, the dog being cared for by Dr. Dick and Mrs. Fred. I didn't see him again for several weeks, as they removed him at once to the house. I missed him very much, especially nights when the other horses were out. One circumstance that he told me, among many others, I want to mention. He was speaking of the hardships endured by streetcar mules. In the city where he lived, they used all mules on the streetcars. One day he was riding downtown with his master, Ruthie's father, when, through the carelessness of the conductor in neglecting the brakes on the downgrade, the car ran right on the poor creatures, cutting them very badly, and breaking a leg for each. That was the first occurrence of the kind I had ever heard of, but very many have come to my knowledge since. Just of late years, humane societies are looking for such things a little in our northern cities. But what is being done along this and other similar lines is but a drop in the bucket compared to what there is to be done. That spring, Julie became the proud mother of a handsome roan colt, and, as it was born on Chet's birthday, it was given to him. He named it Topsy. Chet was all father, hasty, passionate, headstrong, yet a coward withal, who must have a guiding hand to keep him anywhere near the right. This hand, so far in his life, had been the slender white one of his mother. Carm, three years younger, was more like the gentle being who gave him birth, naturally refined and good, but, unlike her, easily led and controlled. Could a sad calamity that visited the family the next fall have been averted? How different might have read the story of these lads' lives. The summer was not particularly eventful, as far as I could see but I had a premonition of coming ill. Master seemed dispirited, and frequently told me that life was not worth the living. One morning I was surprised to feel a side saddle on my back. Master put his face close to mine and whispered words that put me all of a tremble. It was a sad hour. Tenderly, Dr. Fred lifted his wife to my back, while Dr. Dick mounted Prince. For the first time, I noticed how pale Mrs. Fred was, and how worried her husband looked. After that, I carried her often for a time, sometimes accompanied by my master, as on the first morning, but more often by Dr. Fred on Julie. He dared not mount Prince. After a while, the saddle was given up for the single buggy, and then the gentlewoman ceased going out at all. It was late one morning before Bob came out to attend to us, and I noticed that he was crying softly. She's just been like a mother to me, he burst out at last. And now she's gone. I'll never have another such a friend. I was wild to ask some questions, but of course could only paw and whinny softly until Master came slowly in. The first thing he did was to lean his head down on my shoulder and murmur, She's with Annie now. God help us all. I understood it then. Our sweet mistress was dead. The year following was a dreary, irritating one, and yet better than its successors. The boys grew perfectly lawless, save when their Uncle Dick spoke. Dr. Fred drank a good deal, to drown trouble, he said. 
Bob and my master only remained unchanged. Mrs. Fred had been dead one year and nine days when Fred brought home another wife. She was so different from the first one, and so silly it seemed to me. I had not forgotten my mistress, and I wondered if her husband had. Dr. Dick told me again and again that it was a perfect shame, and Bob made faces at her back. Chet and Carm, mimicking their father, tone and all, called her, my dear, and when bidden to call her mother, replied that their mother was dead. She became furious before she had been Mrs. Wallace a week. Her husband sided with her, and there was one continual row. After her bridish sweetness, as Bob called it, wore off, she was quite able to hold her own, and either flogged the boys herself, or had Dr. Fred do it every day. Often, when the latter was intoxicated, my master had to interfere to save the children from being maimed. All that was evil in those two boys grew and flourished. All that was good withered and apparently died. They grew cruel and unjust to us horses. But for all that, I pitied them, especially Carm. By spring, Mrs. Wallace had tormented her husband into the notion of selling out there in K and removed to M, the growing little city from which she came. Further, she turned Bob off and installed her brother Parker in his place. We horses used to talk the changes over sorrowfully and wonder if she would manage anyway to get Dr. Dick out of the way. The night before Bob left, he and Master were talking in the barn. I would stay here and let them go by themselves, the latter said. But Fred can't get along without me. He's not himself all the time, and I feel so badly for poor Nanny's boys. In fact, I promised her to stay with Fred and do the best I could by him. I'll stick by him. Life is nothing to me anyway, only as I can help some person or thing. I know he found Bob a good place, but it was a sorry day for us when Park Winters became hired boy at the Wallace stables. Well, we all moved to M. The doctors bought a house in town, but the office was two blocks away. They also bought a farm a mile out and put a man named Stringer on to farm it. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of White Dandy, a Horse's Story, a Companion Book to Black Beauty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. White Dandy, a Horse's Story, a Companion Book to Black Beauty, by Velma Caldwell Melville. Chapter Six. Before I had been in M long, I was willing to admit that hitherto I had seen and heard little of the dark side of life for the dumb creation. The doctors rented stalls for us in a big livery barn, usually trying to keep one or two of us at a time out at the farm on pasture. At this latter place, I learned considerable of the beauties of country life from our standpoint. The Stringers were average people, ambitious but erring in judgment. They were thoughtless and ignorant, rather than cruel, intentionally cruel, I mean, but it does not alleviate in the least the pangs of thirst and hunger, the pain of extreme heat and cold, the tiresomeness of long continuance in an uncomfortable position, or the woes of a mother torn from her offspring, to know that carelessness is the cause of the trouble. I tell you, I used to pity even the chickens on that place, and, in conversation with other animals, there and elsewhere, I have learned that the stringers represent the majority of farmers. There are so many, what they call, big things to attend to, that there is no time for either attending to dumb creatures' comforts, or stopping the small leaks in the grain sacks. I am not surprised at all that so many farmers die poor and so many go fretting through life declaring that farming don't pay. It will never pay the great stringer majority. Speaking of the chickens, I have seen them trailing their wings through the hot dust, day in and day out, peering everywhere with their anxious little eyes for one drop of water. On that farm there was only a well, 
and the water was drawn up by means of a pole with a hook on the end of it it was pretty slow hard work so that no animal got all the water it really needed at any time besides we are just like other folks we need to have water where we can drink if we are thirsty not be obliged to gulp down a lot when we don't want it simply because we know it is all we will get for hours men feed us things that burn and irritate our stomachs just as salt fish does theirs they drink when they are thirsty if that is every few minutes but with an equal longing for water we must wait their convenience if that is all day we are oftentimes sick and feverish too just the same as people but we can't speak and so we must endure the torture after being driven furiously through the dust and under a pelting sun it is terrible to suffer from a burning thirst but no worse for a man than for a horse and no worse for a horse than for a canary bird we do not suffer always in proportion to our avoir du poids or mental caliber mrs stringer was in the habit of shutting hens up who differed with her on the subject of sitting in boxes or barrels without food or water and a good many times she was surprised after leaving them there three or more days to find them dead a terrible death to die to all but literally burn up with setting fever inward thirst and lack of fresh air if i were a man what i am going to say now would be wicked but i am only a horse well i have often thought that a place i hear men around livery barns speak of said to be heated by fire and brimstone will like as not receive many recruits from among ministers and deacons who have neglected to water and shelter their horses and stock here and among the so-called christian women who let their chickens especially setting hens die of thirst people who are so stingy of god's cold water here will know what thirst means in eternity or i am mistaken and the hogs on that farm how they beg squeal for something cool and clean to drink somebody who thinks just as the stringers did laughs at the idea of a hog wanting a clear cool drink more is the pity why time and again have the poor swine told me that they only drink swill and such because nobody ever offered them anything better they don't mind having decent swill used to mix their messes with but they can appreciate a clean drink as well as a man can i get out of patience too hearing so much about the dirty hog when the poor creature would be clean if he had half a chance of course his ideas of cleanliness differ from a dainty maiden's he enjoys a mud bath but he will always take clean mud if he can find it and he doesn't enjoy wading around in a filthy pen more than you or i would is there anything cleaner or prettier than a young pig take one and give it decent care and surroundings and it will never disgust you with its filth the majority of swine are fed on rotten putrid things simply because they are swine one blessing the careless owner of either hog or fowl who allows it to eat that which is unclean will get it all back second-hand if he eats the creature there were not less than a dozen calves in a barren lot on this place and i used to actually dread my day out there because of the ceaseless bellowing for water kept up by the helpless creatures it was the business of the hired man to fill up a tub over in the lot for their convenience but there was always so much to do and everybody was in such a hurry that it was forgotten or neglected more often than it was attended to and then the owner wondered why his calves were such scrawny things the cows were little better cared for though they usually got a small allowance of water once a day they did not begin to give the milk they would had they been abundantly watered though and suffered in proportion there was one thing that mrs stringer was righteously diligent about and that was salting them this would have been most commendable had there been drink supplied in connection as it was it only augmented their misery we horses fared better because park was sent out with strict orders to refill our trough with cold water twice a day of course he did not always obey and i suffered enough long sweltering days to make me pity the other creatures that fared worse 
the most trying thing of all would be when during the day we cows calves and all could hear the familiar sound of that well pole as the family drew and appropriated the cooling liquid it did seem they might understand the bellowing on all sides but if they did they heeded it not my master was so busy the first year that he paid little attention to the farm but the second summer toward the end he had a pump put in the well that worked wonders for a while and then they grew as neglectful as ever of course we did not stay out there much in winter but were back and forth sometimes for my part i wished i might not go at all but the lecture my master gave mr stringer one evening paid me for being present it was coming on a cold sleet storm and his cattle were huddled in the leeward side of the barn otherwise unprotected their piteous lowing could not but attract the attention of a man like dr dick why do you not provide shelter for them hadn't lumber there seems to be a good many boards and pieces of timber going to ruin around here and there is all the straw decaying in the field where the machine left it you could have built sheds and any essential that was lacking we would have provided well it don't hurt critters to stand out it just hardens them i tell you sir you are mistaken all domestic animals need shelter clean bedding and plenty of food they need it and it is their right they furnish you with food and much of the money you have do they not in turn deserve something besides you are defrauding yourself when you defraud them the neglected cow will not begin to do as well in the way of milk and butter as the one that is well cared for the food she eats must go to keep her from freezing it acts in the place of fuel as it were while if you attended to keeping her warm it would go to make milk and meat these are unalterable laws of nature disregard them and you pay the penalty not only here but hereafter god has promised mercy only to the merciful we went on then for the storm was increasing but a few days later i noticed that rude sheds were in process of construction and the straw was being brought in to help in the work i am so glad that my master dares to speak his mind and yet he never does it in a way to offend any one can see that he feels every word that he says and above all he practices what he preaches speaking of the care of cows reminds me of one that used to hang around the livery stable and pick up the straw that was thrown out from our bedding and at night especially very cold ones she would come and lie on the manure pile some of the men said it was for the sake of the little heat in the manure and they thought she must have a wretched place at home and be almost starved into the bargain i watched my chance and asked her about it she said her owner was quite well off but that he looked upon an animal as having no more feeling than a wagon indeed that he took better care of the latter than he did of her that she was hungry all the time and oh so cold she was not giving milk just then so they paid no attention to her she said she had been in the pound twice and that was dreadful but she would as soon be there as at home i guess the pound man thought she belonged at the livery stable until park winters called his attention to the matter and she was driven off and i never saw her again it seems strange that people could sit down to well-filled tables knowing that their animals are starving and lie in soft warm beds knowing that they are freezing master says that for all these things man shall be brought into judgment but it don't help the dung creatures now end of chapter six chapter seven of white dandy a horse's story a companion book to black beauty this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lynn thompson white dandy a horse's story a companion book to black beauty by velma caldwell melville chapter seven such a variety of horses as one meets when boarding at a livery stable and what stories they can tell 
a tough-looking pair of mustangs gave a little of their experience one night they said they were once wild roaming over the western prairies at will but that some indians caught them with a lasso and then sold them to a cowboy the latter named them daredevil and wildcat and began to break them regularly as he took us in hand said daredevil he knocked us each down from ten to fifty times why i used to be just crazy from fright and pain but he called me vicious and said he would pound it out of me sometimes he would strike me on the head and stun me so that he would think me dead but he never seemed to care had he used us kindly i do not think we would have been hard to manage at all after the strangeness and fright wore off a little but such treatment as he gave us brought out all that was bad and wild i guess it would have made a daredevil and wildcat out of any creature he did not mind at all if the bit tore our mouths till the blood poured out or the whip laid open our shoulders and flanks till he could lay his three fingers in a mustang can stand anything how frantic we were for release from such torture and how hard we tried to kill ourselves and then put in wildcat when he considered us broken he used to ride us almost to death many and many a mile have i run without stopping for breath with those dreadful spurs pressed deep into my bleeding sides indeed said daredevil the wound never healed in mine it was just tearing a little deeper each day then it seems they were stolen by a half-breed indian and sold to another white man who treated them no better his business was to assist emigrants across the mountains and he used to overload them and goad them with a sharp pointed staff until they were obliged to move on some way they lived this sort of life for three years then being almost worthless he sold them to an eastern man who was buying up mustangs they were shipped to chicago in a close wretched car being forty-eight hours at a time without food or water i can give you no idea of the horrors of those days said wildcat it was just like what burning alive must be and we all got so ugly that we kicked and bit furiously two or three of the weaker ones were trampled to death but when once the agony was over they were objects of envy we all wanted to die a few became delirious and had to be shot when we were taken out daredevil and i matched so perfectly that we were at once sold together again to a little fellow from wisconsin he seemed to think that being mustangs we would require a good deal of abuse and hard work and not much to eat anyway he only paid a few dollars apiece for us i have noticed that the more an animal costs usually the better care it receives this fellow used to pound us till the neighbor women would come out wringing their hands and crying and beg him to stop he would tell them that it was the only way to manage a mustang desperate at last daredevil watched her chance and planted both her hind feet in the small of his back one day and doubled him up it did me good to see the folks venture gingerly up expecting us to scalp them i suppose and bear him off he knocked us down a good many times and then without any pity kicked us till we got up we were immediately sold to an easy-going individual who worked us very hard but was decent in his treatment this was the best place we had had and we tried to please him his easy-goingness got him into debt though and we had to go for that to the man who now owns us he is a notion peddler and well enough when sober but he is usually drunk he may start in the morning and drive us till after dark without a drop of water or a bite of food there is one thing said daredevil as her mate paused if only men knew half as much as they think they do they would never pound and abuse a mustang pony there is lots of work and endurance in us if well treated and we can appreciate kindness as well as a thoroughbred if they will give us time enough to realize it we have no sort of chance to be good and the way they treat us would spoil any creature there was a little silence after the mustangs had ceased speaking and then jenny a livery horse spoke well 
You certainly have had a hard life and probably always will But if there is any fate to be prayed to be delivered from it is the fate of a livery horse We are always on the road why this is the first night I've been in this week and every sound I hear I think they are coming for me I have grown so nervous that I can't sleep and my whole body aches a drummer hired us last week on Wednesday to drive out to s 19 miles said he would be there all day and possibly all night Do you know he only stopped there about half an hour gave us Nellie and I some water and then drove 15 miles to L There he had us fed and watered and in an hour was off 14 miles to K And it was late when we got there and by daylight he was on his way here a good 40 miles by the nearest route We had barely been rubbed and fed when a young man wanted a team to take his girl to a party 10 miles out The boss supposing we had been at the barn at Hess all the time since the morning before Only while going the 38 miles there and back sent us out again It did seem to me when they began to harness us that I should scream right out how I longed for the power of human speech My but didn't that fellow drive we acted pretty tired I suppose for presently the girl said John don't drive so fast the poor horses seem tired Nonsense they are livery horses and that is one of their tricks He tied us dripping with sweat in an open shed and left us until near morning Actually, we were so stiff we could not seem to get along at all but he was not sparing of the whip we were in until afternoon sometime and one of the boys used us to carry a couple of women to s he rested us an hour and then came home again and so it has been right along and i am so tired and then this being driven by everyone is ruinous on mouth and nerves it is jerk 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 and no two mean quite the same thing by the way they twitch the lines and half of them don't know how to drive anyway Yes put in Crusoe another livery horse and the worst of it is the spirit people manifest toward us Why a clergyman had me the other day go up to B and he drove faster than any jockey on the way He picked up an acquaintance who remarked after a while on his fast driving Well said the minister I always like to get the worth of my money and I've got three dollars invested in this animal today Oh Me and how they swear at us chimed in a small bay mare from another stall who the clergyman asked Julie now for the first time speaking up No, I did not quite mean them though I carried a bishop or some sort of a big gun once to the train and we were late I'm inclined to think he swore to himself though all he said out loud was I could have made that team cover the ground, but I meant people in general Then somebody from another stall spoke out in a tone quivering with sadness My friend if you are not blind don't complain of your lot Amen came softly but distinctly from another corner and we all kept silent Presently the first voice said it seems strange enough to be counted old and only fit to be banged around without this dreadful sightlessness She paused again and I ventured to ask the cause of her misfortune It is inherited my mother was blind and not of much use but to raise colts they said Whether they knew that blind mothers are liable to transmit their misfortune or not I do not know but the fact remains I could see all right until I was four years old then one day getting pretty warm a mist seemed to come before my eyes It remained growing steadily more dense until at night. I was entirely guided by my mate and When loosened from him could not even find the familiar watering trough What ails Kate somebody asked while someone else added she acts blind Presently my master examined my eyes and gave it as his opinion that I was stone blind and I was and have been ever since no words can describe what I suffer no one has a thought of pity for a blind horse it is just rush them along I'm so much afraid everything startles and terrifies me I am always stepping on stones or bruising myself on stumps and things that I cannot see 
I stretch my neck out long to listen and I am jerked and called an old blind fool It hurts my feelings too. It is so dreadful to be afflicted and then be taunted with it and scolded about it Nearly all my brothers and sisters went blind in the same way We Wallace horses longed for a barn of our own where we could have our little family visits once more and where we should not see and hear so many harrowing things Topsy was growing a fine little animal, but between Chet and Park she was bound to be ruined These two were never friends and the latter was besides jealous of the young owner He tried a variety of means to make her nervous and unmanageable always picking at and tormenting her He had her so that she would both kick and bite Remembering his own unhappy experience it made Prince furious and then there would be trouble between him and Park Of course the former got the worse of it because man is the stronger in the only sense that tells and the latter would tie him short and then whip him or kick him Chet had no judgment and being exceedingly passionate he whipped the colt for doing what Park taught her meanwhile Mrs. Wallace's sister Minnie Winters had become almost a member of the family she was not very old nor ugly and professed the most unlimited admiration for that dear little dandy as she gushingly termed me Though why she called me little I can't imagine and I did not like it either I noticed though that she did not make as much fuss over me when my master was not around She said a great deal about horseback riding and hinted strongly that she would like to try my back Dandy's life is like my own said master all work and no play By this he intended her to understand that I had no time to take her out for pleasure One day master and I were starting for the country when someone called him It just happened that I was tied near an open window inside of which sat mrs Wallace and her sister and I was obliged to hear their conversation you ain't half trying min the former said Goodness friend you expect me to throw myself at the man's head Dick Wallace is a different man from Fred and not to be so easily won Indeed, I don't believe he has any notion of marrying notion of it Of course he hasn't but you must put him in the notion He has a romantic idea that his heart is buried and all that oh do hush fan Somehow I can't bear to think of his having loved any woman like that and I think dandy was hers It all seems like a novel of course but if I were in your place, I'd be Mrs. Dr. Dick or know the reason why I Know the reason why now laughed the girl and then growing sober she added I am not good enough for him if he wanted me few women are Nonsense well you are evidently badly smitten any hush. He's coming interrupted min End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of White Dandy: A Horse's Story, a Companion Book to Black Beauty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand.《White Dandy: A Horse's Story, a Companion Book to Black Beauty by Velma Caldwell Melville.》Chapter Eight. There was a very learned young man, a lately fledged M.D who while spending a few weeks in the town often sought my master's company among other things he the young man talked pompously and heartlessly of his love for using the knife i just delight in surgery he affirmed when i first went to college the sight of blood unmanned me and i was weak enough to shrink from cutting up even a cat but i soon cut my eye teeth and now i don't mind anything would like no better practice than to dissect a live human being as master made no reply and the bloodthirsty young m d did not understand as i do a certain ominous silence on the former's part he went airily on i intend to make a specialty of scientific research as soon as i've earned money enough to make it possible there is very much to be discovered yet i am convinced by the way i suppose you read all the reports of our own and german vivisectionists i confess to skipping some Strange the young fool blundered right on into the trap, but then he had the big head whatever that is Master says all young doctors have a spell of it and that some never fully recover and thought master's silence was induced by a feeling of ignorance and inferiority 
well said he you know of course that chloroform is not used as much as formerly in the practice our modern scientists are using curare a drug you understand that paralyzes motion while sensibility is unimpaired it is a great thing the creature endures the greatest amount of suffering possible under the circumstances and makes a fine study i have a few notes here taken from recent reports i assure you they are worthy of attention vivisection is going to prove a boon to suffering humanity i knew by the tremor along the reins that master would be unable to control himself much longer and then the young man read an extract taken from a book he called a microscopical study of changes that told of the torture of a number of kittens some were starved eleven hours and from that on up to seventeen they were then made mute and motionless by means of this drug curare but were acutely conscious after this stimulation was continued for five hours in another case the sciatic nerve in various creatures was stimulated with electricity from one half to seven hours there was a good deal more telling of the work along this line in various noted universities and medical schools speaking of instances where the sciatic nerves of cats are divided and the spinal cord experimented upon in rabbits it told of their wild shrieks of agony in dogs the thyroid glands were removed and their consequent sufferings described a noted eastern scientist excites inflammation in the eyes of small animals by passing a thread through the corner and applying croton oil hot irons and the like another professor hobbled over one hundred forty dogs and then dashed them from a height of twenty four feet upon bars and ridges of iron and so he went on telling of cutting up live animals even of a horse that was vivisected at last he was describing with evident relish the sufferings of a dog that some new york professor had twisted all out of shape and fastened in a plaster of paris cast for several weeks the creature's sufferings being so great that it scarcely took any food at all when master burst forth well i can never begin to tell what he said his words were like thunderbolts and the very atmosphere was blue with the lightnings of his righteous wrath out of it all i learned that he considered vivisection cutting up live animals not only unnecessary to the interests of humanity and science but a most criminal proceeding he denounced the vivisection professors as bloodthirsty scoundrels who under the pretense of making scientific research are merely satisfying a bloodthirsty curiosity of their own he said such men are never public benefactors that in truth they care nothing about alleviating human ills or prolonging life it is a mania with them to cut 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 torture 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 he further said that something must be done to stop vivisection in our common schools and colleges that ordinary pupils have no need for even lessons in dissecting dead bodies footnote it is exceedingly to be regretted that vivisection is creeping into our common schools and lower institutions of learning nothing can be more useless and harmful and it behooves patrons and school officers to be on the alert we have enough of bloodshed and anarchy menacing our commonwealth without training our youth to disregard the rights of the helpless and inure them to the shedding of innocent blood and footnote physiology he said can be taught all that is needful without recourse to hardening brutalizing experiments for his part when his hour of suffering comes he said he wanted a physician with a heart as well as a head and he would sooner that a boy or girl dear to him would grow up unable to read or write than to be a scholar without feeling in humanity his conclusion was something like this and now my young friend pardon me if i have spoken hotly but i feel deeply on these matters you with thousands of other youths are more sinned against than sinning you admit that you were tender-hearted when you went away from home influences and seem ashamed of it crush that feeling my boy the manly man is always tender-hearted in other words godlike pity and tenderness are god's own attributes further you will never be a truly successful physician unless your touch is tender as well as firm unless your heart is as full of sympathy as your head of wisdom i do not say that there may not be some experiment necessary in medical schools but none where entire insensibility is not induced i know what i am talking about and thousands of our older and better physicians at home and abroad bear me out in this statement i guess the young m d was glad that master reined up at this juncture before a pretty white cottage anyway i noticed that he neither resumed the conversation nor attempted to patronize master during the remainder of the drive end of chapter eight chapter nine of white dandy a horse's story a companion book to black beauty this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by k hand white dandy a horse's story a companion book to black beauty by velma caldwell melville 
Chapter 9 that morning my master stopped first at a farmhouse where everything betokened plenty but not thrift a man was slopping hogs the latter were in a small enclosure wading in mud almost up to their bodies how hungry they seemed and how vigorously he dealt blows right and left with a club he carried the low troughs were one-third full of mud and into these he poured the swill dear me i thought they can never eat it but they did that is some of them a few of the weaker ones were crowded back and got nothing Often in passing that place in winter I have noticed that in feeding cattle the fodder was thrown on the ground to be pawed over, stamped in, and the greater part of it wasted. The cattle here were thin-looking in the spring, with apparently no ambition but to find a tree or rail against which to rub. I was not surprised when I heard that that man had mortgaged his farm. Toward noon of the first day mentioned we drove into a farmyard where a boy unhitched me and turned me into a nice pasture. There were several horses and cows beside. One of the latter ran ceaselessly from side to side of the enclosure, calling piteously. No need to inquire her trouble. One look into her dark, pleading eyes, and anyone could recognize a sorrowing mother. One of the horses told me that it had been just that way for almost a week. That day and night it was the same. Said he, she has not eaten a mouthful since her little one disappeared. You see, they let it run with her until it was seven or eight weeks old. She was so proud of it, and an uncommonly cunning calf it was. They were always together, but one day some men came and drove it away, and she has been almost crazy ever since. Just then the poor animal passed near us in the endless circuit, and such a look of agony and entreaty as she wore. Presently a man came to the bars. Straight she rushed toward him, bellowing piteously. Of course, he passed indifferently by, and then turning she walked to a little clump of trees. See, said my companion, she will stop under that oak at this corner. There is where she used often to lie with the calf and sure enough she paused there, smelling the ground over and calling in a low tone. Then down on her knees she went, laying the side of her face against the sod, and moaning and crying as any human mother would. Oh, it was pitiful, pitiful. One has to stand a good deal like that in this world, the big roan said, turning his face away, and yet people think we dumb creatures have no feeling. I wish we hadn't. A while ago the family let another cow and calf run together in the same way, and then butchered the little creature right before its mother's eyes. She has never been the same since, doesn't eat, and her milk isn't good. Poisoned with the grief and fretting, but the folks don't understand. Another day I was grazing in the pasture of one of Master's patients, when I noticed a cow standing in the shade of a tree contentedly chewing her cud. A happy-looking creature, I remarked to the old family horse, who was quietly grazing away his days. Yes, he said with a smile, and right here, let me say, horses do smile. She thinks her calf is over on the other side of that high board fence, in the calf pasture, while in reality it was sold a week ago. You see, our master is a merciful man. He separates the mothers from their young almost from the first. For a while he lets the calf through a door in the wall to its mother three or four times a day, then twice, and finally not at all. But all the while each is content, because they believe the other is right there. The cow is not worried and gives down her milk bountifully. The calf is content and thrives. My master is not only merciful, but shrewd. And you seem to have an easy time, I suggested. Easy to be sure. He says I have done hard work enough to retire, and have earned money enough for him that he can afford to keep me on the interest of it. One event of interest, to part at least of the Wallace family, I have not mentioned. It was when we had been at M, about a year. Grim had been down street with the boys, and on reaching the gateway of home he fell in a fit. Master and I had just driven up. Mrs. Wallace from the piazza gave a cry and began to scream, Mad dog! Poor Grim, coming out of it, rolled his eyes piteously from one to another. With a desperate struggle he regained his feet and attempted to walk, but his back gave way, and before the doctor could reach Grim he lay writhing in another spasm. Mrs. Wallace screamed the louder from a safe place inside the door, and Master, speaking rougher than I ever heard him speak to her before, bade her be still, adding that the poor fellow had been poisoned. "'Bring me a bottle of sweet oil from the office,' he commanded Park, "'and be quick about it.' Grim was coming out of the fourth fit when the oil came, and among them they managed to pour a gill or so down his throat. He had ever so many more spasms, but finally got better. That is, he did not die then, but never got well. Just pined away and finally died. By this means we became aware that M had a cat and dog poisoner. A man too mean to live and too wicked to die, the neighbor said of him. Many handsomer and more valuable dogs than dear old Grimm fell a victim to his rascality, but few were more sincerely mourned. 
so officious was this individual that it was nothing uncommon to see little girls bending their curly heads over pet kittens stiff as death or ladies wringing their hands in agony over the sufferings of some canine or feline pet and the sufferings of the latter were terrible to witness but i have heard say that every town has one man in it so far lost to human decency that he assumes the right to thus torture other people's pets master says there is nothing uncertain about the future of such men i don't quite know what he means do you Minnie winters professed to be not over strong these were mrs wallace's words and the latter frequently asked dr dick to let her sister go with us when we were out for short drives he could hardly refuse of course i heard every word of their conversations and noticed how commonplace all the doctor's remarks were and how adroitly he parried all sentimental or even personal allusion on his companion's part but nevertheless i was uneasy i did not think so badly of minnie but mrs wallace i believed capable of any treachery after a while i remarked that all the men and boys about the livery stable smiled significantly when my master came in and by and by when he was out i heard them saying among themselves that he was going to marry miss winters Remembering the past as I did, I was sure they were mistaken. But still the way Dr. Fred had done had somewhat shaken my confidence in men. Indeed, I worried not a little, and one day, when my master announced that he was going to Chicago for some weeks, I could not decide whether the movement bad or ill. The last thing before starting, he caressed me and whispered loving words in my ear. Surely he could not do that, I thought, if he were untrue. It seemed a different world to me when he was gone. Mrs. Wallace and her sister used me continually, and I had no idea that women could be such merciless creatures. They demanded that I trot all the time, up hill and down, and then kept a continual nagging that made me quite frantic. My mouth was all sore and chafed from the ceaseless jerking and slashing of my back with the lines, and no matter how strictly I obeyed them, it was all wrong. Part of the time they rode on my back. The saddle did not fit me, and there was a rough place inside that wore a sore. Nobody noticed this, though. In fact, I was scarcely curried or rubbed at all. Every time the saddle went on my back, I grew worse, until one day the pain became unendurable and I ran away. Think of me, Dandy, running away. I left Miss Minnie in a heap by a roadside, but on I went, that wretched saddle tearing deeper into me every moment. Somebody saw me and called out, Dr. Dix, Dandy, running away, as I live. This seemed to bring me to my senses, and when they yelled, Whoa, I stopped. I was all of a tremble. They led me back till they came to Minnie, crying by the roadside and rearranging her hair. At first she refused to get into the saddle again, and I hoped she'd hold out, but she didn't, and I had all I could do to keep from running again. Her weight hurt that sore, so. The next day we went again, with Park on Prince for escort. The saddle hurt as badly as before, worse, I guess, and presently when they undertook a race the torture was too much, and I reared, throwing my lady off again. Park caught the bridle with a jerk that almost threw me to the ground, and while I was recovering myself he slid from his horse. Tying the ladder by the roadside, he removed the saddle and proceeded to give me the dreadfulest whipping, with the whip he carried. I had never been really whipped before in my life, and I scarcely know which hurt me the worst, the lash or the injustice and humiliation. Probably the lash, though, for it cut mercilessly into the sore. Suddenly Minnie screamed, "'Don't, don't, Park! Just see the blood!' Oh, what will the doctor say? But the young man was mad, I suppose. Anyway, he thrashed away until he was tired. Sobbing hysterically, Minnie wiped the blood from my back with her handkerchief and refused to mount again. They had a quarrel, but I was too faint and sore to pay much attention. And to think, I could never tell my master one word about it. That was four days before he came home, and I was not out of the stable again. Dr. Fred came in the morning after my whipping, examined my back, and swore frightfully said he'd a notion to horsewhip park and promised him his dismissal when master came home it all tended to make the fellow ugly and every one of the wallace horses have cause to remember those four days they seemed a veritable reign of terror all the while he was putting something on my back that smarted it dreadfully of course dr dick visited my stall the first thing i laid my head on his shoulder and could have cried with relief the moment he moved away i would recall him with a whinny and he finally led me out with his own hands for some water that spot on my back was the first thing to catch his eye in the perfect light but park was ready with a plausible story about minnie trying a side saddle on me just because i needed exercise and it rubbed my back that was all i never heard any more about it except that master pitied and petted me even more than before thinking of the thousands upon thousands of poor creatures that are abused much worse every day and never receive a kind word or pat i felt that my lines were cast in pleasant places anyway i never heard any more about master marrying miss winters and after a while she went away 
just prior to this last event she and mrs wallace drove out with me and i heard the former say i hate dandy i believe i am jealous of him such a pretty dapple gray was brought into the barn one night her back one mass of ridges made by a whip what a shame one of the stable men said and she's a willing piece of horse flesh too yes said another but some fellows think it looks big to whip like that shows their power and importance shows their fools end of chapter nine chapter ten of white dandy a horse's story a companion book to black beauty this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by k hand white dandy a horse's story a companion book to black beauty by velma caldwell melville chapter ten at stated times buyers came down and people from all through the county brought in their horses cattle sheep and hogs of course one set of buyers did not deal in all these but there were horse buyers cattle buyers and so on when the horse buyers were coming our barn and even the sheds outside used to be full of horses many of them already sad and homesick people may think that dumb animals cannot be homesick but i tell you they can all there is of life for the average domestic creature is the comfort it takes resting at night in a familiar place and eating and drinking where it is accustomed we have few joys and the future holds no hope a familiar voice even though an abusive one is dear to us i have seen dogs cringe and fawn on most inhuman wretches because they acknowledge them as their masters and so it is in a less degree with almost all of us soon after master came home from chicago there were an unusual number of horses and men in need of accommodation and about twenty of the latter slept in the haymow in the evening they all sat talking overhead and so it happened that i could hear their conversation i tell you i kinder hate to sell them they are black ponies of mine said one i've raised them from colts and i think a heap of em but i've got to have money to raise that mortgage and it's the only way just the way i feel about them there bays of mine put in another and i can't help fearin they will fall into hard hands it is kinder rough said number three to think of fetchin em right away from their homes where they been for so long and turnin em out amongst perfect strangers to be taken land only knows where how would we feel if it were us or our children horses don't sense sich things as we would said another don't ye fool yourself billy they do i raised a fine colt once kept her till she was nine years old then sold her to a man twenty miles away he came for her and when he went to take her she seemed to know she wasn't just lent or hired and such a mournful whinnying i never heard before nor since she was always such a willing creature but then she pulled back and all but balked my how the children cried and took on i felt myself as if i'd committed a crime well do you think when i got up in the morning that creature was back in her old stall tired and muddy but just as happy she had traveled the forty miles and was home again the next day the man came again she resisted and pled harder than ever but of course he took her he shut her in safely that time six months after he was driving by our place when she set up such a neighing and despite his best effort she turned in at the gate i went out and she acted so tickled I persuaded him to stop to dinner, and I assure you she was bountifully cared for in her old stall. She left again reluctantly. Three or four months later she got out of her pasture and came home. Five years after she came again, and the queerest thing was she hadn't forgotten us a bit. It always makes me blue to think what she had suffered from pure homesickness in those years. That minds me, said another man, of a big gray horse my daughter used to own. She sold sewing machines and drove the animal nearly every day for two or three years, then she sold him it was maybe two years after that that she was crossing a pasture one day when she saw a big gray horse making swiftly toward her it scared her a bit at first but when he neighed she knew it was old jim would you believe he came straight to her and laid his head on her shoulder if that ain't memory and affection for you what is it yes and the wonder is that folks ain't no better to em than they be they get mighty rough used sometimes i knew a man down east he pretended to be a sort of a preacher too that used to pound his horses for just what was his own fault one day he overloaded em and because they couldn't pull up a steep place he got back of em and jabbed em with the tines of a pitchfork till the blood just trickled down at another time he got mad at one of em and taking her out of the harness beat her till he knocked her down then he hitched the other horse to her and made him drag her all over a stony rough pasture 
when the neighbors seed him the trail her body made was marked with blood but he let him know he'd do as he pleased with his own her side was all tore to pieces and after sufferin a while she died i see a fellow just last week put in another knocked his horse down then because she couldn't get up he kicked an eye out mercy on us cried the first speaker if i thought them air black ponies of mine would ever fall into such hands i'd take em home and let the blamed mortgage foreclose there's no tellin answered another well i'm sellin said still another because i'm afraid my horse is gettin the pole evil and i've had one trial of that it ain't hard to cure take it in time said another i've cured several well i'd like to see it done said the other i tried everything far and near and she just got worse some of the things just made her crazy once she started and walked a dozen miles before she knew what she was doing i guess poor thing well you see pole evil generally comes from a blow on the head or from the wearing of heavy bridle and if taken in time and the cause removed the treatment ain't much just rubbing in arnica but if matter forms then something else has to be done i for one don't believe in a raw hand chopping into horse flesh no more than human flesh get somebody that's used to the business to cut open the hard swelling and put in lint saturated in glycerin calendula and water put isled silk over this and fix a linen hood over leaving places for the ears tie it under the throat and wet it three or four times a day with the same stuff you put in the opening if the lump gets soft the doctor can open it and let the stuff out cleaning it all out careful sometimes they say it ain't safe to open em and they inject weak sulfate of zinc ounce a day when the matter gets thick and white it's better to inject the glycerin calendula and water again the animal needs care and toning up there's getting to be less pole evil than there used to be someone remarked yes since new barns with high doors have taken the place of the old low log stables and we use lighter bridles it was with a heavy heart that i saw the poor horses hurried off in the morning but it made me feel better toward men that some of the owners looked sad and gave a kindly parting pat master had to make an early trip and so it happened that we were passing the depot when the poor creatures were being driven into the car strange surroundings strange voices strange everything i thought of the story the mustangs told and wondered if these horses would fare better or worse presently we overtook a pedestrian and master invited him to ride i soon discovered that the latter's mind was full of the same subject that filled mine i tell you martin i wish there were mercy shown the dumb beasts of course we have to buy and sell and all that but things are at a fearful pass especially on railroads and in large cities i never realized it as i did while i was in chicago a few weeks ago and the scenes i saw there have haunted me ever since carload after carload of wretched-looking cattle were brought to the stockyards having come thousands of miles some of them without one drop of water it turned me faint used as i am to suffering to see the piteous pleading in their sunken frightened eyes great heavens it was a sight to remember and then the way they unloaded them there were thousands of them and people were in a hurry the poor beasts weak and terrified as they were did their best to obey the rough unintelligible orders but assistance was inhumanely rendered by the men using heavy poles with great iron spikes in the end prod 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 time and again the cruel iron pierced to the hide and buried itself in their quivering flesh the air was full of the cries and moans of fright and pain many were hauled out dead or dying something of what they endured may be conceived when one witnesses their frantic greed for water it is terrible to think of the torturing thirst that had lasted for days i tell you man there's a day of reckoning coming when men will cry unto the mountains and hills to fall on them and hide them but why do they abuse them so water is plentiful martin asked well i suppose it saves time and trouble but the main reason is greed they starve them for water then give them a chance to drink all they want just before they are weighed thus increasing their weight dishonestly then when saturday night comes the water is shut off and the poor animals in the stockyards get no more until monday and of all dreary hot dusty places on earth those stockyards take the lead but the worst of all is the cruelties of the slaughterhouses hundreds of cattle crowded around awaiting their turn to be butchered and gazing with staring eyes at their mate's bloody fate you know how the smell of blood terrifies such creatures their whole systems are doubtless poisoned with the agony such meat cannot be healthy now there could be humane means devised for all these proceedings if only men cared if only they cared echoed martin much impressed by master's words End of chapter ten chapter eleven of white dandy a horse's story a companion book to black beauty this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Joy, Detroit, Michigan. 
White Dandy, A Horse's Story, A Companion Book to Black Beauty, by Velma Cadwell Melville, Chapter 11. One autumn, Master determined to go west. Why he went, I do not know, but he was to stay some months, they said. How I did hope he would take me along, but he did not. Be kind to Dandy, was his parting injunction, as usual, to Herman, the man who had succeeded Park Winters as holster. Of course, I did not know what going west means, and could not think that some months were longer than the time he had spent in Chicago. The morning he started, he came into my stall and talked to me a long while. Among other things, he said, Be a good boy, Dandy, and when I come home, we'll go and live at the farm, you and I. I did miss him so. The days were all dreary, and I dreaded to go to sleep at night, because I would be obliged to awake to a fresh sense of my loss. I cannot begin to give all my experience during his absence, but will note a few instances. Of a truth, I realized as never before what it is to be a horse. Dr. and Mrs. Wallace were not a happy couple. The latter was less outspoken than in the early days of her married life but she was equally as self-willed, only more cunning and underhanded about it. Fred drank all the time, but people could not ordinarily tell when he was intoxicated. The barn boy said that he could, quote, carry a good deal. The two boys, Chet and Carm, were wild and lawless. The former was smart and a great student, though. Poor Carm, better but weaker, was always in disgrace. His teacher and father called him a numbskull, and gradually the latter came to indulge Chet in everything and deny Carm just as prodigally. There were two other children in the house now, Tommy and Elizabeth, or Bobby, as the little girl called herself, and others fell into the habit. I liked Bobby from the time Master first held the little yellow-haired creature on my back for a ride. She always clapped her little hands on seeing me and cried, Dandy! Dandy! I liked her for herself, and also because Dr. Dick loved her. It did me good to know that he had this little child to pet and think about. Things went well enough for a week or so after Master left. Then Chet began to drive me. Sometimes when the doctor would use me for a long drive in the day, Soon after dark, while I was yet eating my supper, the boy, with some companion, would come into the barn and put my harness on. Herman would object, and there would be a fuss between them, always ending in my being hitched in a buggy or road cart and driven out. It was the second time that this occurred that I discovered that Chet was under the influence of liquor, as was also his companion, and they carried bottles with them. Chet used the whip freely, and I went as fast as I could, but the oftener they touched those bottles, the harder they drove. And after what seemed to me hours of agony, they pulled up before a brightly lighted old building in the country, hitched me, and staggered in. The wind was raw and cold, and the sweat pouring off me. I surely thought Chet would remember my blanket, but he didn't, and there I had to stand, one, two three, four or more dreadful hours, long before they came out. I was alternately chilling and burning. I ached and trembled. They drove me home as fast as they came, whipping nearly all the way, though I was doing my best. Herman swore profusely. People did not do that around the barn when Master was home, as he rubbed me down rapidly with a coarse cloth before blanketing me closely. How I felt, and thirsty. It did seem I must have water or choke, but he gave me none for some reason. By morning I was so stiff I could scarcely move. My breath was short and came hard, and my skin was hot. Dr. Fred ordered me early. I don't think Dandy is able to go out, sir, today, Herman replied. The young gentleman had him out all night almost, and he is all stiffened up. Dr. Fred muttered something and ordered out the bays, calling out to Herman as he drove off, to get Dr. Dick's box of horse medicine and give me acodite, two drops, 
doses of the tincture every two hours until the fever was gone, then to alternate baronia, and thus according to directions given in the book with the box. I noticed that I began to feel better pretty soon, and by afternoon Mrs. Wallace said she wanted me hitched up. Herman demurred, but had to finally give in. I was as stiff as ever when I got home again. That very night Chet harnessed me again, despite Herman's angry protest, and drove me ten miles. If only he had taken the trouble to look in my eyes, I am sure he must have seen how wretched I felt. This time he carelessly threw a blanket over me, but did not buckle it over my chest, and in a little while the wind had blown it half off me. It would have been entirely off, and it might as well have been, but for a corner catching on the top of the collar. That time, Gray was showing in the east before he started home. With vile, profane words he bade me get up, emphasizing by stinging blows of the whip, saying to his companion that he must make the ten miles before his father was up. I suppose no man was ever compelled to stand tied to a post all night. If there had, he would surely be going up and down the earth, preaching mercy and justice to those who have the power over horses. Another thing that made that night especially wearing was the fact that I was tied short, and my front feet were much lower than my back ones. Such a strain as I was on. It does seem that horses deserve a little consideration necessary to tie them in a decent spot. I have had many of my kind speak of this matter. In some villages, the hitching places along the sidewalks are most uncomfortable, the animals being obliged to stand on a twist, off times with the front feet lower and in a mud puddle. Is it any wonder that we sometimes protest by vigorously pawing the sidewalks if we reach them? Give us our fair play. Well, I was too lame to go out at all after that night for a week. I had rheumatism. Had Master been there to treat me, I might have recovered. But Herman knew nothing about horse doctoring, and so it ran on. If I did get a little better, it was only to be overdriven and exposed. Another time, there was to be a horse race five miles off, and Chet drove Prince and I in the buggy. Then I found out how it hurts to be a heavy-bodied, short-legged horse to be driven with a light-bodied, long-limbed one. He drove us, as usual, just as fast as he could make us go, uphill and down the same. More than once I thought I should fall, and by the time he stopped, I was wider than ever nature intended me to be, being covered with foam. Prince was not nearly so tired, but he said it irritated and fretted him to be driven with a horse of my build. It was only a little country horse race, and the animals were chiefly working ones with neither inclination, strength, nor training for the race track. The men were wild with excitement, and betting was going on all around. After a while, three men got on their horses' backs and started. The crowd yelled and clapped their hands. The riders buried the cruel spurs in the horses' sides and leaned as far forward as possible. Of course, someone had to beat, and it was the long-legged, bony creature that won the first heat. Three times the same ones ran, and twice the long-legged one won. But the others had done their best, and yet more than that, I may say. Poor things, there they stood, sweat and blood covering their sides, every nerve and muscle overstrained, and their masters cursing them for their defeat. The entire afternoon was consumed in this manner. Among others, Prince was taken on the track. I knew by his eye and the poise of his head that he did not like it, but he behaved nicely until a cruel-looking fellow got on his back and dug the rowels in. With one bound he was off, and the rider had hard work to keep his seat. He won the heat, and I could scarcely enjoy his victory. When— Quick as a flash, he reached out, and catching the fellow by the shoulder, flung him headlong some feet away. Someone caught the bridle strap, and as soon as the fellow could pick himself up, he flew at the offender, dealing him a blow between the eyes with a club, chancing to be handy. "'Hold on!' Chet cried. But another and another blow followed. My noble gray friend staggered, gathered up, staggered again, then fell. A half-dozen convulsive shivers passed over his frame, 
and he was dead. In a fury of anger and terror, the young master sprang upon Princess Slayer. They grappled, but stronger hands separated them, and Chet had only to put my harness in the buggy and get on my back and ride sorrowfully homeward. Dr. Fred was in a temper, to be sure, and immediately had an officer after the man who had killed his horse. All night, and for many nights, I could not close my eyes without seeming to see poor Prince in the death throes, and all because he dared to resent unfair treatment. I heard Herman say that the fellow had paid for the horse, and that Chet and his father had had a quarrel, and that Mrs. Wallace insisted on the former leaving home. "'Yes, she's mighty keen for the first woman's boy to leave home,' remarked an old man who worked around the barn. "'She's wantin' him out of the way so her young uns will get the property. "'Guess there won't be enough to fight over if Dr. Dick stays away too long,' Herman replied. "'Speaking of horse races reminds me to say that if all race horses, or those that are made to run, could tell their stories, they would fill a volume with tales of injustice and suffering. All animals will, if humanely treated, do their best for their masters. But a kind word and reassuring pat will go much farther toward winning a race than all the spurs and curses in the world. Many a race has been lost through the very efforts made to win it. Coolness and self-possession are indispensable in both horse and rider. I remember of being at a state fair with my master some years later, and witnessing a race. Among the competitors was a handsome little black horse, all grit and goodness, but, owing to its owner being partially intoxicated, it lost the stake, in consequence incurring his wrath, and how he did pound the noble little beast. A number of disapprovals rose from the multitude, but no one ventured to interfere. The animal was his, you know. End of chapter 11. Recording by Beth Joy. Detroit, Michigan. Chapter 12 of White Dandy. A Horse's Story. A Companion Book to Black Beauty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melina Barker, Whitefish, Montana. White Dandy, A Horse's Story, A Companion Book to Black Beauty, by Velma Caldwell Melville. Chapter 12 I had no idea before that year's experience that little things, at least what men call little things, could so affect the health and spirits of a horse. I had even felt a little scornful sometimes, when I saw strong-looking animals go along with drooping heads and noticed how dull and stupid they looked. But when I came to endure hardships and have no petting, though Herman was better to me than most men are to their own horses, I felt differently about it. We need encouragement. Chet did not take me out after Prince's tragic death for some time, but Dr. Fred drove me a great deal, as there was only the bays and myself then. Topsy had no regular breaking yet, but Chet declared his intention of attending to the matter at once. When he did undertake it, he frightened the poor thing almost to death, and what the outcome would have been, I can only surmise, had not a humane man noticed him one day and chided him for his method, or rather lack of method. Let me show you my way, he said. I suppose Chet was getting tired of the job, so surrendered. From being always handled, Topsy was all right, so long as no harness was introduced, or any unusual mo noise made near her. But at the first un unfamiliar sight or sound, she was a bunch of terrified, prancing nerves, expecting the worst, and usually getting it in the form of a whipping. She's got to learn that I am boss, was a favorite expression of Chet's. Well, my boy, said the gentleman, I suppose it is necessary for a horse to know it has a master, but it is equally necessary for us to recognize that they have rights, and also that bullying an animal is not being, in a manly sense, its master. Now I have broken scores of horses, and never yet whipped but one, and I have always hated myself for doing that. 
Then he began to gently rub Topsy's head and neck with his hands, and later with a brush. She seemed to enjoy this, and when he let the latter gradually pass over her shoulders and back, she offered no resistance. He worked with her fifteen minutes or longer, then turned her into the little enclosure she occupied during the day. I think I neglected to say I was resting out at the farm for a day or two when this occurred. In two or three hours the man came again and repeated the handling and brushing, only this time he touched the whole body, talking kindly and reassuring all the while. She is going to be an uncommonly easy subject, I predict, he announced. But who would have patience for such slow getting on? Chet scornfully asked. I should imagine a little time apparently wasted in the beginning, less lost than a fine horse, ruined in the end, the old man quietly answered. When he let the young mare go, that time she seemed slow to leave him, though he had brushed her even to her heels. The next time he handled her with greater freedom, brushing and talking and finally showing her a little sack of straw. She eyed it a while, smite, smelled it, then seemed not to care for it. The man now began to rub her with this, gradually increasing the noise it made. Of course, she was a little shy of this and inclined to go away. A few gentle touches of the brush reassured her. Then he put a halter on her. She had often worn one before. After this, he applied the straw again, stopping every little while to brush and smooth her. In a little time, she paid no attention either to the noise or the touch of the sack. The next day, he gave her four lessons of similar character. Later, he rattled tin cans and the like about her from head to heels and had small boys blow tin horns in all directions. Topsy told me afterwards that so long as she could hear that man's voice or feel his touch, she was not afraid of anything. Afterward, he gradually introduced the bridle and harness. Like all horses, she objected to the bit, and I fancy people would make more fuss than we do if they had to wear it. It was the first night that Topsy was at the livery barn after her breaking, and she was saying she minded the bit worst of all. An old horse replied that, that well she might hate it. For years, she said, my tongue has been in a measure paralyzed. It always hangs out of my mouth when the bit is in, and I can't help it. Sometimes it is more helpless than others, and I almost starve. I get better at times, where someone owns me who puts a bit in my mouth that don't hurt, but I am getting used up anyway, and change hands often and the majority of bits makes the trouble worse. I was once troubled in that way, spoke up another horse, and my master kept changing bits until he got one that was all right, and then I got over it. I, too, had a paralyzed tongue, said another, but it was not the bit, it was genuine paralysis. Might have been caused by that in the first place, though I never thought of it. Anyway, they applied electricity to the nerves and gave me some medicine three times a day. Strychnia, they called it, one hundredth of a grain at a dose. I soon got well. My tongue was all torn to pieces once with a frosty bit, put in another, and how I did suffer. No one noticed it until it was all ulcerated, and I could not eat and scarcely drink. My master was one of those careless fellows who never examines his horse and seems to forget that, however much they suffer, they can't speak for themselves. He did not know what to do for me and so sent for a neighbor who told him to use alum wash until the ulcers were all gone and leave the bit out, of, out until my mouth got well, meanwhile feeding me soft food. And still another spoke of her teeth becoming long and rough and lacerating her tongue badly. She said they filed the teeth and wet her tongue and mouth with a lotion made of calendula and water. Topsy was a beauty in harness, and Chet was proud of her in his way, but from the first I feared hers would be a hard life, but my darkest forebodings came short of the dread reality. Among other experiences, that winter was one in horseshoeing. Master had been exceedingly particular always about my feet, but Herman was like a majority of other men, 
knew nothing of the business himself, and trusted entirely to the smith, who chanced to be a new one. I had often heard Master and the good blacksmith in the old home denounce the fashion of trimming the frog and thinning the sole until it yielded to the pressure of the thumb, and that was just what this smith did, and then he put on great heavy shoes, driving in spikes rather than nails. I admit that I kicked and plunged, but it was all wrong, and I knew it. Then the last spike went through into the foot. This made me rear and plunge worse than ever, and the blacksmith struck me with the hammer. See here, Dr. Dick Wallace won't stand that, cried Herman. He allows no man to strike Dandy. Don't reckon he's better than other horses, he answered. Folks might differ on that, said Herman. Well, I got out of there at last, but my foot hurt intolerably, and I limped. Herman spoke of it to Dr. Fred, but the latter was one in one of his gruff moods, and only answered, It most always lames him at first. That night a man came for a doctor in great haste. Someone had taken poison by mistake. Dandy was ordered. If I could have spoken, how soon I would have convinced Herman that, with that terrible torture in my foot, I could not go, but I could only mutely look at him, and he, half asleep, paid no attention. It was a good many miles we went, and the doctor drove like mad. It seemed to me that running through fire would have been easy compared with the pain in my foot, aggravated by the ceaseless concussion of the hard roads. With a blanket thrown over me, I was left tied in a shed. How I longed to lie down on something! All I could do was to hold up that leg. The pains extended clear into my shoulders, and the cords of my neck were growing stiff. After a long time, a man came out and unhitched me from the road cart. The moment I was free, I lay down. Directly, the man ran and brought Dr. Fred. They bade me get up, and rather than to disobey, I tried it, but the moment I threw any weight on that foot, had to immediately lay down again. Presently the man noticed me holding that foot, and asked if I was not newly shod. Then Dr. Fred remembered. Well, Dandy, he said, we must get home. Try it once more. I got on my feet, but had to hold that one up for a while. Gradually I compelled myself to put it down, for I knew we must go, as he had said. That was long years ago, but even now I can feel some of the agony of that slow journey. He went with Herman and me to the shop, and fiercely ordered that shoe removed. The smith was not nearly so independent then. When the doctor saw the heavy thing, he raved more than ever. Do you put such shoes as those on a horse like this? he cried. The result was that all the shoes came off, and I was put in my stall till my feet got well. An ounce at the toe means a pound at the withers, quoted the old stableman, and there's truth in it. Glad the doctor had sense enough to refuse them. It was four weeks before I could be shot again, and in the meantime I had a very sore foot. They gave me aconite to keep down my fever, and used arnica on my foot after paring away the horn and poulticing until separation ceased. My one thought was, will Master never come home? And so the winter and spring passed. Several months I thought as much. My experience was pretty much the same right through, but I felt years older when once again I rested my head on my beloved master's shoulder. There was a new stable boy when he came back. Paddy, they called him. Dr. Fred and Herman had quarreled some time before. There was a new span of horses, too, John and Jean. The old stable man privately told master of some of my hardships, and with tears in his eyes, the latter whispered, Forgive me, Dandy. End of chapter 12 Recording by Melina Barker, Whitefish, Montana Chapter 13 of White Dandy, A Horse's Story This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. White Dandy, A Horse's Story, 
by Velma Caldwell Melville. Chapter Thirteen. One morning, while waiting for Master to finish talking with a man, we heard a scream, and the next moment Bobby came rushing out, crying, "Uncle Dick! Uncle Dick! Come! Come! Tommy has stolen my little kitten all dead! Hurry! Hurry!" With two bounds, her uncle cleared the space between himself and the door and disappeared for a moment to appear again in the kitchen, the window of which was open. Plainly, I could see the dripping kitten rushing frantically about the room and Mrs. Wallace flourishing the broom as if it were the offender. Tommy complacently looked on. By the stove stood the pail of hot water into which he had dipped it. Quickly, Master put the kitten in cold water, then, drying it, gave a brief order. Reluctantly, Mrs. Wallace brought a bottle from somewhere, and he carefully worked some of the contents through the fur of the skin. Mrs. Wallace's face wore a sneer, but Bobby's, sweat and tear-stained, turned confidingly up to his. And then the good man's indignation got the better of his chivalry and he gave my lady a lecture that greatly offended her. Among other things, I heard him say, As you sow, so you must reap. You may see the time that you will remember this little burned kitten. I would not be a prophet of evil. Nevertheless, I say the hand that ruthlessly puts a pet to such torture as this today may in the future as readily slay a fellow man. Were his words prophetic? We shall see. Very often after his return did I hear Master speaking of things he had seen in the West, and while, like other men, he spoke often of the country and people, unlike them, he told of the dumb creation. You're a regular crank, Dick, Fred would say, soft-hearted as a baby. But then he would pat him on the shoulder, and I know that there has always been a tender reverence in his heart for this noble brother. To me, they were wonderful stories, those about the horses of the plains and the cattle of the ranches. Seeing is believing, Master said. I went there in the fall when the creatures were in good condition, and watched every phase of their existence until they, or their survivors, were in the same condition again. But what they endured meanwhile no earthly computation could estimate. I doubt not the record is being all kept straight above. I made my headquarters with an old friend and schoolmate, one of the most humane ranchmen on the plains, I presume. I told him I wanted no varnish but reality, and he said I should have it. He owns a large ranch, his nearest neighbour being eighteen miles distant. There is, in the clearing, the usual ranch house, stables, sheds, horse corral, and the like. Their horses all come from the wild ones, and a few of them become truly tame. My friend has one, old Mark, who follows him like a dog and obeys him as readily as Dandy does me, but he is an exception. Sometimes those not in use wander off and are gone for months. When they find them, they are as wild almost as ever, and have to be broken all over again. And this breaking was one of the things that seemed so inhuman to me, but you would not believe flesh and blood could stand what they do anyway, and live. And such looking creatures, apparently nothing but skin and muscle, and so hardy that men grow naturally, I suppose, to think they have no feeling but to me they presented a piteous picture of dumb faithfulness and brute misery. Despite their hardiness, they are as capable of suffering as the man who rides them. Of course, old Mark can endure more hardships than Dandy, just as his master can endure more than I, but that does not alter the fact that we can all be overworked, abused and suffering. Immediately after breakfast, the men on my friend's ranch gather the horses into the corral. In the centre is what they call the snubbing post. Here the men stand with ropes, and as the animals race around the corral, they lasso the ones they want to use that day, and then the rest are turned loose again. Some of them get quite tame. 
I told Charlie that if I were a ranchman, I would have them every one obedient to my voice. He assured me that, as a rule, it ain't bronco nature. He had a professional breaker, bronco busters they call them, break a few new horses while I was there, but I only watched the operation twice. That was quite enough for me. These busters get big wages, for their work is extremely dangerous, and they are always in such a hurry that what they do is done in the quickest way, which is generally the roughest. Time and again they jerk the poor creatures up, causing them to turn complete somersaults, and sometimes breaking their necks, of course. Then, by the roughest of main force, they saddle and mount them. True to his nature and common instinct for self-preservation, the animal bucks, doing his best to unseat his rider. This he rarely succeeds in accomplishing, and at the end of an hour or two he is submissive through sheer fatigue and pain. Three of these lessons are deemed sufficient. Horses broken by more mild, humane means, even ranchmen allow, make quieter, better servants. Then there is the branding of the ponies, without which the owners could not tell their own property. In accomplishing this, the animal is blindfolded and led up to a roaring fire, where a man with a red-hot branding iron awaits him. Quick as a flash, there is a sickening odour of burning hair and flesh, and the frantic animal goes forth with his owner's initials, mark, or whatever it may be, indelibly branded on him. These horses can climb like a mountain goat, and in winter they subsist on the bark of the cottonwood tree, or on the dead grass that they pour down through the snowdrifts to reach. Oft times their hoofs are worn to the quick, and blood marks their trail. Spring finds them mere shadows, and so weak they can hardly walk. They endure hardships better than the cattle do, though. These last lead woeful lives in the winter season. I did not get there for the fall round-up, as they call the gathering together of the herds, but when I did see them, they were sleek and contented-looking. Soon after, Charlie and his men moved theirs into the broken lands, where there is some chance for shelter and a bare chance for their subsisting on the natural hay that abounds there. The past winter has not been a severe one, yet more than half of his cattle perished. Some grew so weak and stupid that they ceased to pour up the frozen grass. Some, very many in fact, perished in ice storms. Their coats become as cakes of ice and they die by inches. Some die for want of water, some mired in the spring in their frantic rush for it and so on. Wherever one goes after the snow melts, the sight that meets their eyes is dead carcasses. The hardened beholder thinks only of the loss to the owner, but to the uninitiated, each gaunt form with his sunken eyeballs and worn hoofs tells a pathetic tale and reminds them of the lingering tragedies that have been enacted there. Pitiful enough look the forms of brute mothers lying in a way to show that they defended and sheltered their helpless young to the last. But looking along the lines of dead, I almost decided that their fate was preferable to that of the survivors, who must yet fake the living death of the cattle car, and finally be inhumanly butchered. At best, the lives of these creatures are full of pain and misery. Another harrowing scene is the branding of the calves and young cattle at the May Roundup. I witnessed it for an hour and then turned away, but I could not shut the terrible din out. The ordinary method is to corral a large number of cattle and then rope the calves and unbranded animals, drag them to the fire and proceed as in case of the horse. Dust, smoke, blood everywhere, and the air full of the smell of burning flesh. Then there are calls, oaths, coarse laughter, bellowings, moans, and cries of pain and fright, making wildest discord. I pitied the poor little calves most. They are generally caught by the leg, or legs, and jerked rudely over the ground to the branding place. Here two or more other men 
grab them and hold them down while the cruel deed is done. The little things seem so terribly frightened and helpless. The little while I watched, I saw several of the older animals badly burned on their shoulders and faces. These were mothers who charged in defence of their young. Then the hot iron struck one steer in the eye, completely destroying it. The men scarcely noticed such a happening, but I could not forget the suffering. I would rather earn my bread far down in the mines than by trafficking in flesh and blood. In the spring all the stock is reduced. I may say they are barely alive, but when the rains come and fresh grass springs up, they pick up rapidly. Thus would my master talk until it seemed to me that we were pretty highly favoured. But there has never been a winter since, but I have thought often about the starving, freezing herds out west. End of chapter 13「Chapter Fourteen of White Dandy, a Horse's Story, a Companion Book to Black Beauty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christina Webb of Christiansburg, Virginia. White Dandy, a Horse's Story. A Companion Book to Black Beauty by Velma Caldwell Melville Chapter 14 Chet drove Topsy a great deal. Too much for so young a horse, the old stableman said. One day, when he brought her in, her back was a perfect network of welts raised by his cruel whip. Oh, Topsy, I said, what were you doing? The poor young thing hung her head pitifully. I thought I was doing all right, but he jerked the lines this way and that, until I became so nervous I did not know what to do and finally stumbled. With that, he stood up in the cart and whipped me. It seemed every blow cut in half an inch. I reared and plunged to escape the lash, but he kept on till I got quiet through sheer exhaustion. Oh, me! I wish I were dead! Men have the power, and they are so cruel. Another time, he drove her until she was dripping with sweat, then led her to a spring of cold water and dashed it all over her. Everyone about the stables said it would kill her, but she got along with only a severe cold. About this time, Dr. Fred sent Chet off to school, and I, for one, was relieved. Carm drove Topsy then, but she said he was never abusive, only sometimes forgetful. After Chet had been gone a few months, there came a letter from him that made a deal of trouble in the house. What it was about, I cannot really say, but Master announced to me one morning that we were going to live at the farm. I was glad, for I was tired of the livery barn. We moved right away but I could see that something was sorely troubling him. A man and his wife by the name of Pell ran the farm now, and a breezy young English couple they were. She especially pleased me with her sunny ways and funny pronunciation. She fixed Master's room up, ohm-like, she called it, and was always tucking posies in my bridle or feeding me with sweet cakes. I thought she would cheer Master up if anybody could, but though he smiled often, he grew quickly thoughtful again. Plenty of people came for him, and after a while he bought another horse named Dexter. I knew he owned John and Jean just as much as Fred did, but I suppose he thought it best to leave them where they were. After a while, Queen and Julie were sent out. I wondered at first until they told me they were worn out and they had been sent out to pick up. I know what it means, said Julie. We are to be patched up and sold. We've served him, Dr. Fred, until we are used up. Now we'll go to the first bidder. It proved true, and in two weeks a rough-looking man drove them away. Several years after, 
While waiting at a gateway for Master, I noticed something familiar looking about an old horse attached to the separator of a threshing machine. I could not place her at first, but as they came nearer I saw it was Julie, or what might be her walking skeleton. I spoke to her as she was stopped near me. Oh, Dandy, she cried, I am so glad to see you, and you don't look a day older. I asked her about herself and Queen. It is a common story, she said. Queen was run to death one night by some wild boys. First she fell down, but they pounded her till she got up. She staggered on a little further and fell again, the blood gushing from nose and mouth. They left her there, and in the morning she was dead. I envy her, though, said Julie. Better be dead than dying, I say. Just then the man belonging on the separator came up and with an oath bade her hold up her head. She gave me a sad, hopeless glance as she tried to obey. The machine was set not far off, and as Master was a long time in the house, I had an opportunity to watch Julie and her mates all thin, half-dead-looking creatures. The man on the horsepower shrieked, cursed, and slashed right and left with his long whip. On Julie and an old blind horse, it seemed to me it fell most often, though. After a long, dizzy run, during which the poor creatures staggered more than once, they stopped, and without the slightest cause for so doing, the driver went around and kicked Julie a number of times. I have found by observation that this is the usual way with the world. Young horses may receive some care and consideration, but as soon as they begin to fail they are neglected or sold, and by old age their condition is pitiful. I wonder if the money Dr. Fred got for the bays will prove of sufficient good to him here to offset the record of misery he will have to face some day up there. Who can tell? We had a nice time at the farm. Dexter and I had plenty to do, but neither considered it any hardship to be tired in Dr. Dick's service. Mr. Pell had a span of quiet farm horses who, like ourselves, were content to serve a good master. All the stock and poultry were well cared for, and nothing of the tales of woe from the livery stable reached us here, save when Topsy or one of Fred's horses came out for a day. After a while, Master came into my stall one day with an open letter in his hand. Oh, dandy, he said, what can I do? Then he told me that Chet was drinking and gambling and had written to him for money. I feel that I ought not to send it to him. At the same time, I promised to stand by Minnie's children. That woman has turned his father against him and the latter has sworn never to send him another cent to help him out of his scrapes. He sent the money, though, then and once afterward. How long the estrangement between the brothers might have lasted I know not, had not Fred fallen ill or something. They said he had snakes, whatever that is. Patty came in great haste, and Master was away nearly two days. He looked very worn and white on his return, but afterwards seemed more cheerful. And in time I learned that his brother had quit drinking and signed a pledge. They were much together after that, and finally the townhouse was given up, and the family came to the farm. I was very sorry, only I was glad to have Bobby again. Mrs. Wallace was in poor health, too, and spent most of her time in bed. Mr. and Mrs. Pell stayed on just the same, and great friends they became with Bobby, but the boys were trials to all of us. Tommy was his mother's boy, Master said, and I guess he did not mean it for a compliment either. By and by, even good-natured Mrs. Pell got cross with him. He chased the young chickens to death, clubbed the pigs and cows, crushed the little chickens between two boards, trampled the flower beds, and made himself generally hateful. Appeals to his mother met with, Don't bother me, my nerves are all unstrung, or, Poor child, he is so full of his pranks. 
Then Mrs. Pell spoke to his father, and that gentleman brought the youngster to the barn and whipped him with his riding whip. After that, a threat to tell his father curbed him some. Chet was away two years before he came home at all. Two years at his time of life makes great changes, and he came back a tall, slender youth, with a bit of dark down on his upper lip, and a thoughtful, studious air that was becoming. He was through sowing wild oats, he said, and we all felt very proud and glad, all but his stepmother. Of course he drove Topsy out the first thing, and when I saw her on her return, I knew that Chester Wallace still carried a cruel heart in his bosom. She said he drove as mercilessly as ever. I pitied the poor thing, for I knew that she loved her young master despite his cruel treatment. It is the way with us horses. He was home two months or more, and Topsy looked jaded and worn when he went away. I wonder that men do not more often notice when their horses have a fretted look. It is a sure sign that they are being hurt in some way. Our eyes and facial expressions speak louder than words, if people cared to consult them. I noticed a horse not long since, whose countenance was distorted with pain, yet his owner paid no heed, only cracked the whip and crowded him on. As you hope for mercy, drivers, show it to the animals you drive, remembering that as you measure, it shall be measured unto you again. Carm had no taste for books, but was wild to be a railroad man. Just as soon as I'm old enough, he said, I shall be a brakesman. And Mrs. Wallace encouraged him, anything with her, to get them away from home. Her relations with Chet through the summer had not been pleasant, so he stayed another two years before returning. A man in stature and will, he came home that time. Everyone outside admired him, and he really seemed a fine man. His father suggested that he superintend the farm for a year or so, until he decided what he would do. The Pells had long been gone, and the help outdoors and in was transient. He finally decided to do it and went to work. All was well so long as he did not get angry, but he lost his temper on the slightest provocation, and oft times without any. Especially was he hard on anything in his power. One morning I saw him get angry at a cow, because she had wandered into a lot where she did not belong. Grabbing hold of a pitchfork, he gave chase. Round and round the lot the frightened creature ran, too confused to see the narrow gateway. Chet jabbing the fork into her at almost every step. The longer the chase continued, the madder he got, and the less chance the cow had for escape. How long it was I cannot say, but it seemed an age to me before Master appeared on the scene, and, in thunder tones, bade him cease. Gently he drove the trembling creature from the lot. Blood trickled from some of the punctures, and as soon as she found a quiet place, she lay down. Days and weeks of suffering followed, and then Master said she must be put out of her pain. Chet was plowing with Topsy and another horse one day. The former had a sore mouth brought on by his nervous, irritating way of twitching and jerking the lines. Exasperated at last, she worked the bit up so as to hold it with her teeth. Instantly flying into a passion, he drew his knife from his pocket and gashed her mouth far back on either side. Such a sorry sight as she was when he shamefacedly led her into the stall, blood running in a stream from either side of her face. It was not the pain, and there was plenty of that, and inconvenience too during the weeks following, so much as it was the injustice and cruelty that hurt sensitive, high metal Topsy. There was a stormy interview between uncle and nephew in the barn, while the lacerated mouth was being sewed and dressed. If there was a law in this state that would touch such fellows as you are, I'd use it on you, cried Master hotly. And there will be one. Mark it. End of chapter 14
Chapter Fifteen of White Dandy, a Horse's Story, a companion book to Black Beauty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. White Dandy, a Horse's Story, a companion book to Black Beauty, by Velma Caldwell Melville chapter 15 that fall master was elected to the legislature whatever that is and was gone pretty nearly all winter i did not like it at all for though chet dare not injure me outright he was at times very disagreeable and i never felt safe a minute about the other animals i did hope he would go off and study medicine as he sometimes talked of doing when master came home to stay he seemed quite elated over some law they had made for the protection of dumb brutes but he said it would be a long while before officials generally would be faithful in its enforcement that was an unusually busy spring with the doctors and chet managed the farm to suit himself among other barbarous things he did he allowed to be done by paddy who had come to work for us was tying the young calves to stakes and leaving them there without food or water for hours of course at first there was a little grass for them to nibble but this was soon gone often their ropes became wound around the stakes until they could only stand helpless with their heads drawn closely down one pretty little heifer rosebud bobby called her was thus tied and getting wound up died a slow torturous death after this event he put all the young animals in a small barren lot where the scenes of the days of the stringers were reenacted. Day and night there were piteous calls for something besides dry hay. Once a day a large trough was filled with water, but this the older, stronger animals quickly drank up, and the younger, weaker ones had to go without. One calf had its legs broken in a vain effort to slake its burning thirst. With a moan of pain, it dragged itself away to a fence corner and sank exhausted. Days it lingered there. A few times, Calm and Paddy carried it a pail of skimmed milk or water, barely enough to prolong its agony, I thought. The supposition was that it had only hurt its leg and would soon be better. Master was scarcely ever at home in daylight, and Bobby was made to believe the calf would soon be well. When they found it dead, its poor, parched tongue protruding from its mouth, and a look of mute reproach yet in its sightless eyes, they dragged it away as unconcernedly as if it had been a stick of wood. Several times Chet tore suckling calves from their mother's side and permitted rough men to lead, or rather drag, the pleading, frightened creatures off, paying no heed to the mother's wild agony unless to speak some hard profane word to her every living creature on the place soon learned to fear and hate him in selling any living thing he seemed to try and invent the most cruel modes of transportation putting calves sheep or poultry in such small cases that they would be piled on top of each other in driving sheep there were always serious accidents happening and many a time has he driven fat hogs in the heat and dust until one would fall by the wayside and then he would kick it to death you would not take him for such a man just seeing him about ordinarily he had a low soft voice and gentle winning ways his influence over his brothers and the hired men was very bad somebody sent him a fine bird dog as a present at last i thought he has something that he will be good to a friend came to visit him and taking topsy and bulow the dog they went for prairie chickens dr dick and i were gone when they returned but topsy told me about it she said that bulow seemed so happy on the way out and that the men sounded his praise continually a fine fellow worth fifty dollars was his master's verdict after a while the dog scared up a covey of chickens and the men rising in their seats shot into them Bring in the birds, Chet said. Bulow stood by them, but refused to touch them. Again and again the order was repeated, but still the animal refused. 
Chet grew white with passion. Never mind, Wallace, said his friend. Some dogs, good ones too, never make retrievers. Something in their early training was wrong. Bring those birds here, roared Chet, paying no heed. The poor dog trembled from head to foot, but stood as if made of stone. A moment more, and Chet had raised his gun to his shoulder and fired, filling the dumb creature's hips with shot. With a piteous whine, the dog dropped to the ground. Get up and come here, roared his master. With an obedience that ought to have shamed the hard-hearted wretch, the animal dragged himself up and to his master's feet, blood trickling from a score or more shot holes. Now, go bring that bird here. I never saw such a look of piteous agony in eyes, human or brute, before, Topsy exclaimed vehemently. It was terrible. Let up, Wallace, don't be a fool, cried his companion, touched by the mute suffering. He'll mind me or I'll brain him, hissed Chet, quite beside himself. Go! Bulow crouched lower and feebly essayed to lick his master's boot. With an oath, the latter brought the butt of the gun down on his defenceless head once, twice, thrice, and then there was a convulsive struggle and a dead dog lay weltering in his own blood. At another time, when Calm owned a common mongrel dog, there was a cat and three well-grown kittens at the barn. Master and Bobby had petted them until they were perfectly tame. For some reason or other, Chet determined that they must die, but instead of humanely killing them, he bade Tommy set the dog on them. This just suited the lad. Getting them all together, he gave the dog his orders. It happened right in my sight, and all I could do was to kick and neigh, but no one paid any attention. Calm and Tommy were enjoying what they called the fun. The first kitten fought valiantly, but soon the cruel teeth sank in her throat and she lay limp. It took a long and exciting chase to get hold of another one. The boys cheered lustily as the kitten fought for the life so precious to it, and the dog shook and bit it. I wondered how the former could claim to be human, and yet stand unmoved at the pleading and terror of the poor little face. So cruel to thus turn upon the happy, innocent creatures, and that, too, on the very spot they had learned to love as home. Little Grey, as Bobby called her, was a mangled mass of wet fur and blood when the dog quit her, and less than an hour before she had played so prettily with her mates. Just then Bobby came out, hearing the boy's shouts of glee. She screamed at the sight of her dead pet, Sam, flying at the dog, beat him with a piece of board. Tom set him on, said Calm. I'll tell Uncle Dick, that I will, and Papa, too, the angry maiden cried. Chet told me to, said Tommy. He did? Well, if there was anything in this world that he loved, I'd kill it, she declared with blazing eyes. But he don't love anything. There were high words between Chet and Master that noon, and I heard the former mutter as he walked off. Old meddler. I'll give you something to make a row about one of these times. A few days later, poor old Puss, while looking for mice in a bin of grain, put her paw into a steel trap that had been placed there by Tommy on purpose. I'll finish this cat somehow, he said. It was late at night when Puss was caught, that is, after the work was all done, and I cannot bear to even think of the torture she must have endured all those long hours until daylight. Paddy found her when he went for oats. Mercy on us, he cried as he caught sight of the wild, glaring eyeballs. She was almost mad with the long strain and agony. Not daring to touch her, he ran for a gun, but the boys, suspecting what was going on, rushed into the barn ahead of him and shouted with fiendish glee when they saw her. Pull her out, shouted Tommy, and loosing the chain that held the trap, they flung that and the suffering creature rudely on the floor. Her paw was crushed at the main joint. I can never forget the look in her eyes as she watched Paddy point the gun, but I am thankful that the next moment ended her misery. Delighted with his success at trapping, as he called it, Tommy rearranged the trap, but, unknown to him, 
Paddy removed and hid it. It's just the way with half the folks in the world, the latter muttered. They have hearts like flintstones. And I knew his words were true, else people would be more considerate and merciful. End of chapter 25chapter 16 of white dandy a horse's story a companion book to black beauty this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by natalie paula white dandy a horse's story a companion book to black beauty by velma caldwell melville chapter 16 one year master and i spent in the city he was supplying the place of a friend in the profession who was sick and had been gone abroad. I saw a good deal of life there, but dark as some of the pictures were, they had in some instances their bright side. In this city a society for the prevention of cruelty to animals had lately been started, and though people generally did not give it much countenance, there were still a few brave, humane men and women who dared to speak for those who could not speak for themselves, who dared to do right despite the sneers and jeers of the world. We dumb animals have reason to thank the Creator that he made a few like these. Horrible cruelties had gone uncensored in this city before. Animals had died for lack of food and water. Others had been cut and mangled by trains and left to die by inches. Lesser creatures had been openly tortured to death, and beasts of burden had been kicked and pounded to death on the streets. Perhaps a month had elapsed after we were settled here, when, as Master drove leisurely down one of the principal thoroughfares, he noticed a crowd gathered on a corner just ahead. Coming closer, we beheld a mule lying on its side, attached to a heavy load of coal. Blows and kicks were falling fast on its head and body. "'Get up, you lazy brute! Get up, I say! Don't try any of your tricks on me!' And then there were more blows, kicks, and curses." The crowd grinned and seemed amused. Springing from the cart, Master asked a boy to hold me, and elbowed his way to the side of the driver. Touching him on the arm, he said gently but firmly, Don't strike again. There is something wrong here, or the creature would get up and go on. He just cussed lazy. Let me handle him. With that, Master stooped down and stroked the mule's face gently, speaking in a kind, encouraging tone. Presently, when it had found it had a friend, it began to struggle to its feet, succeeding at last in standing upright. Then Master began to examine the harness, which was old, stiff, and full of knots. If you would grease this harness till it's soft, and make more pains in mending it, your dumb servant would thank you for it, he said. At that moment he noticed that when he touched the collar the animal flinched and its foreleg trembled. Lifting that part of the gearing, there was revealed a spot as large as the hand of a twelve-year-old child, all raw and bleeding. No wonder, sir, the poor thing could not draw this heavy load with such an affliction as that, the doctor said almost angrily. It wasn't so bad this morning, the man answered, and anyway, that ain't much of a sore to use a mule up. A mule, my man, has just as much feeling as you or I. If you think you'd be willing to pull right along, enduring the torture he's enduring, then there is some excuse for you working for him. But if you don't, then there is not. God made these creatures to serve us. He made us, intending we should be just and kind to them. Then he took a silk handkerchief from his pocket, folded it, and put it over the bruise under the collar. Now, said he, a few of us will push until we get this load well started. You may take it a little way, wherever you can leave it, and then you must promise not to use the mule again till his shoulder is thoroughly healed, and to pad and fix that collar and harness. See here now, Mr. Whoever you be. This your mule is mine, and I don't have to promise no stranger nothing. Oh, well, if that's your game, all right. I meant to be easy with you, but if you prefer, I will have you arrested and fined at once. Fined? Great blazes. Ain't that mule my own? And hain't I a right to cut him to sausage if I want to? The crowd, part of it, laughed, but the rest watched Master earnestly. Maybe you have not heard, my good fellow, that there exists in this city today a society for the prevention of such abuses as this, and that it has the power from the state to arrest, try, and fine you for the deeds you have just committed. In the first place, you used the animal when it was unfit for service, and, in the second place, you kicked and pounded him. 
unless you promise the two things I mentioned, and this one added, that you will be kind and humane in your treatment hereafter, I will complain of you at once. But I don't believe there's such a society at least away. I've allers used my critters as I please, and nobody meddled before. Exactly, and that's the reason the society has been founded. There are too many like you who use dumb animals as if they were made of granite instead of flesh and blood like ourselves. However, if you don't believe what I say, I will prove its truth at once. Well, you look like a man as knows what he's talking about. Anyway, it's kind of you to tuck a fine handkerchief in there. I'll promise. Keep the handkerchief as a sign of your promise, said Master. Now, boys, let's all lend a hand. It took only a few minutes to get the cart to the top of the upgrade, and after that the mule walked slowly but readily off. Master kept him in sight, however, until he saw him unhitched and led away. Another day we met a man driving a horse that limped very badly. Master pulled up and spoke to him. The fellow was about half drunk and very ugly. Mind your own business. This brute belongs to me, was the leering answer. No matter who it belongs to, it is unfit for travel. You can either drive at once to number 12 T Alley, where a veterinary will examine it free of charge, or you will be arrested on the charge of cruelty to animals. The man began to curse and whip the horse. Hold on, sir. Every blow you strike will increase your fine or term of imprisonment. The fellow paid no heed and master signaled a policeman, who put him under arrest. I learned afterward that he was fined twenty dollars and costs, besides losing the use of his horse for many weeks and having to pay for its board during the time. The treatment was given free. A little later, master obtained a police star for himself. It is quite common in cities for the humane detectives to wear a star under their civilian's coat. He engaged actively in the work all the year, reporting a hundred cases or more, for the benefit of persons who think such a society unnecessary, and who imagine there are few cruelties being perpetrated on the dumb creation, I will mention a few of the cases where Master interfered. A woman scalded a dog until his hide peeled off his back. A man got angry at a neighbor and shut the latter's dog in a cellar until the poor animal starved to death. Two young fellows raced their horses until one horse dropped and had to be shot, and the other was practically ruined. A drunken man drove a horse ten miles with a dislocated knee. A jockey drove a horse a mile with one hoof torn off. Another disemboweled his horse with spurs. Three men in fits of anger cut pieces from horses and mules' tongues. Another shot a mule and went away without waiting to see if it was dead, and it was found alive two days after. A colored man overloaded his team, and when they were unable to start the load, he buried an axe in the shoulder of each. Dozens were arrested for driving lame and galled horses, several for using unshot animals on the ice, four blacksmiths for inhumane treatment of horses they were shoeing, two men for leaving cows and calves unprotected until they froze, some for underfeeding domestic animals, a number of butchers were fined heavily for rough and inhumane treatment of animals to be slaughtered, such as punched their eyes out and the like. Then there were the countless cases not on record where kindly advice induced people to be more humane, and I heard Master say that he had spent two hundred dollars out of his own pocket for horse blankets, new collars, easier bits, etc. And now, if there is any evidence lacking to convince the indifferent and skeptical of the need of humane societies and brave men to work, I wish they might hear some of the tales of woe and abuse that were repeated to me that year while boarding at the city livery barn. I remember one handsome pair of imported Arabian horses that were stalled one night there. To look at them, I suppose, they were proud and happy, but they said they were neither. They had to leave their own homes and be brought across the ocean, and through all the dreadful voyage they said they had been obliged to stand up. The swaying of the vessel made them dreadfully sick, and every cord and muscle in their bodies was strained. They were very homesick. Neither the climate or the food agreed with them. At another time, a noted racehorse was there, Queen of the Turf, they called her. She said she would willingly exchange places with an old cab horse. So much was expected of her, and she was too proud to fall below her record. But, oh, she said, it's a hard life, and I long for some freedom and real rest. But it is all training or care. I hate the race course. And here, for the first time in my life, I saw horses wearing the overdraw check and going about with tails and manes cut off. It all seems so unnaturally inhuman, and even yet I think sometimes I must be dreaming. End of chapter 16
Chapter 17 of White Dandy, A Horse's Story, a companion book to Black Beauty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christina Webb of Christiansburg, Virginia. White Dandy, A Horse's Story a Companion Book to Black Beauty by Velma Caldwell Melville Chapter 17 When we returned to the farm, Master saw at a glance that Chet's farming was poor farming. Some new and scientific methods had been introduced that were well enough as methods, but when used by a person unable to modify and apply them to practical use, they fell flat. Moreover, Chet was engaged, badly engaged, Bobby said, to be married. Something else had happened while we were gone that, for very shame, the girl had not written to her uncle, and now I will tell it in Topsy's words. After Chet cut my mouth so badly, he seemed to hate me worse than ever, and rarely spoke in other than a savage tone of voice. Once, or rather a good many times, he spoke of selling me. Said he would, sure, but the old fool raised nice colts. Dear me, it almost kills me to think of his handling my pretty, tender babies. He has always been so unfeeling, keeping them from me long hours at a time when I knew they were suffering from hunger and then letting them nurse while I was overheated. But after Dr. Dick went away, there seemed nothing to check his fits of fury. He don't mind in the least what his father says, and several times boxed Bobby's ears when she interfered. Of course, it makes the trouble between him and Mrs. Wallace worse for him to misuse the girl, though she has never seemed to care much for her herself. It is all Tommy with her. Well, Chet drove me hard, worked me hard, and beat me hard. But I tried to be obedient and to do my duty, until one day my colt, which he had tied to my side as Jean and I plowed, got so tired and hungry it could hardly go another step. Indeed, it was fairly dragging along by the strap. He was in a great hurry to get the piece done as he was going to see his girl, so he would not stop, but kept striking the colt. I endured it just as long as I could then stopped in the furrow. Poor baby made a feeble lunge for her dinner, but, with a stinging blow, Chet bade me go on. I had made up my mind that that colt should have a minute or two of rest and a few drops of milk if he killed me for it. Then I stood still. He dropped the plow handle and lines, and coming around in front of me, cut me full in the face with that whiplash until the blood flew. I tried to shut my eyes and turn my face away, but it was no use. The blows continued until in my agony I opened an eye, and the knot on the end of the lash cut right into it. After that I was so frenzied, I remember nothing distinctly, but Jean says he cut away until Patty, who was working in the next field, rushed over and pulled him away by main force. The colt was so badly choked in the row that it died before morning, and I tell you I am glad of it. I never want anything to suffer as I have suffered, and bad masters are to good ones as fifty to one. So you see, I am blind of an eye. It makes it hard for me. But if I can keep the other one, I won't fret. Bobby had grown into a willful girl though still as sweet and tender-hearted as when a baby. She was the idol of her father and uncle, but had no training. As intimated before, she had never been a favorite with her mother, and I think she secretly realized and resented it. Chet had spells of being very good to her, and when he chose to be agreeable, it was hard to resist him. Carm had fallen in with a bad lot and was going the downward way fast. In a moment of anger, his father turned him out of doors, but Master followed him. He was Nanny's boy. Find me a place on the railroad, 
uncle, and all reform, he said. For the sake of your dead mother, Carm, Master pled, change your ways and strive to be a man. She is waiting for her two boys up there. Must I tell her, when I meet her, that they are lost? But I tell you I will reform if I can be engaged in the business I like, the boy persisted. It is too dangerous, Carm. Reform first, and then I will try and secure for you the position you desire. You are too young yet, anyway. But father has turned me out. I must do something. I will pay your bills if you will go to school two years and behave yourself. I hate books. Nevertheless, Master overruled at last, and Carm entered a business college. There was in our stable at this time a span of young black horses, high-spirited and stylish. They belonged to the two doctors, the firm, as they were called. Chet had a pair of young bays, Topsy's children, that were built more for endurance and, at their request, a trade was made. The blacks, Romeo and Juliet, were as gentle and obedient as they were high-bred and handsome. Everyone admired them, and they were proud themselves, especially proud of their flowing manes and tails. After a while, Chet married the peaked-faced girl to whom he was engaged, and they went to Boston for the honeymoon. This is what Bobby said, anyway, and I know they were gone a little while. Then they came back, she trotted about with him all over the farm, and just went into ecstasies over Romeo and Juliet. Aren't they just too lovely, dearest? She cried every time she saw them. Won't you give them to me for my very, very own? I suppose he gave them to her, or pretended to, for she called them hers after that. I found out about this time, from hearing Master and Bobby talk, when they were out riding, that Cleo, that was Mrs. Chet, was a Boston girl, and that she and Chet had become acquainted during her visit to a relative in M. After that, I heard her telling Chet one day that it was the fashion in Boston to now dock the stylish ponies and cut off the manes. Why, I could not have been more astonished if she had said they cut off their legs. It is so English, you know, she added sweetly. When Master heard her, he said, You mean so barbarous, don't you? Oh, de no, she answered. All the Nabobs and Tony people have their horses that way. All the fools, muttered Master. What an old bear your uncle is, she said poutingly to Chet when Master was out of hearing. Oh, well, you must not mind Uncle Dick. He is cranky on some points, but not a bad fellow, after all, when one is in a tight place. Cleo shrugged her bare shoulders, her shoulders were always bare, and resumed her plea to have poor Romeo and Juliet maimed and disfigured for life. All the horses were talking about it, and the blacks were terrified half to death. I hope it is no worse than having one's mouth cut back and eye whipped out, said Topsy. Maybe it don't hurt at all, said John, and we tried to comfort the intended victims by this hopeful suggestion. It was a cool May morning some months later when a couple of strange men came to the farm and, under their supervision, Chet and the hired man began to build a queer-looking structure of heavy timbers. The doctors were off at a convention to be gone several days. By and by, Bobby came out wringing her hands, her yellow curls all tumbled about her tear-stained face, and begging first her brother, then the strangers, not to do something. I could not hear what. All the men laughed but Chet. He bade her go in the house and not be bothering with what was none of her business. Then her temper got the mastery, and she called him a cruel wretch, and told him he was bad enough before he married the wizened fool from Boston, but was worse now. At this he grew angry, and grabbing her by the arm, he dragged her into the house. 
She was back, however, almost as soon as he was, and, turning up her loose white sleeve, she exhibited a plump arm bearing blue finger marks. See there, she cried to the strangers. You are witnesses to Chester Wallace's brotherly treatment. I have always heard that a man who is unkind to animals will be equally cruel to a woman or any weak, defenseless thing. The men looked annoyed. Finally, one of them said, We are very sorry, miss, but your brother has hired us to come some distance, and we are obliged to perform the operation and go. It really does not hurt the horses much, and it only lasts a minute. All the stylish turnouts in cities are now drawn by docked horses. But Uncle says it is barbarous and ought to be prohibited by law, and he knows. It did seem pitiful. The two mute, dumb beasts, standing, trembling with apprehension, and only the sobbing voice and puny arm of a mere child between them and a dreadful fate. In a rage, Chet spoke out fiercely. Either go in the house, miss, or else stand by and enjoy it. The business is going on. Then I shall stand by, for I mean to report everything to Papa and Uncle Dick. Little tattler, he hissed. Yes, sir, and further you will find yourself your dear lammy darling from Boston and your mutilated horses all out of shelter when Papa comes home. I guess when he sees my arm, your cake will be dough. Nothing but the presence of witnesses restrained the infuriated man from striking the young girl down as she stood. But the merciless work went on. Bars of heavy timber were so arranged that no horse living, once strapped in there, could escape or scarcely move. I could see it all from where I stood in the small pasture near the barn. When all was in readiness, Juliet was brought around, and then I saw that her beautiful flowing mane was already chopped off, so that just a short bush stood upright along her neck. She reared and plunged with fright as she was led up to the trap-like arrangement. Bobby screamed once, then stood white and speechless. There was a brief parley among the men, then Chet turned back, and catching the girl about the wrist, carried her by main force into the house, remaining there himself to prevent her return. The moment they were out of hearing, or sight rather, poor Juliet was roughly hurried into the trap and strapped to stout rings on the floor. There were also straps about her body fastened to rings in the floor. Nearby, in an old shop, Tommy seemed to be attending to something. Of course, the poor horse was entirely helpless, but one of the men stood holding her head. Oh, it was all too horrible to relate, but since it is daily coming to be the fashion, I will try and go through it, hoping some heart may be touched when a plain statement how docking is done lies before them. Then the executioner mounted a block and with a saw began his inhumane task. There was a moment of silence. Then there burst from Juliet's mouth such a cry of agony as I never dreamed a horse could utter. Scream followed scream, as the poor beast writhed helplessly, a look in her face beggaring description. So great was her agony that sweat ran in streams to the floor, and blood and foam spurted from her mouth. As coolly as sawing off a stick of wood, the man worked on cutting through flesh, muscles, tissue, veins, and nerves, until the handsome tail lay on the floor, and there was only a gory stump left. At this juncture, Tommy rushed from the old shop with a red-hot iron. Quickly this was applied to the torn and bleeding member. There was a sickening odor of burning flesh. A sound from Juliet, neither a cry nor moan, something worse. And then she staggered, and would have fallen, but for the straps that bound her. That same scene was enacted with Romeo, whose agony, if possible, seemed greater. They were both sick for some days, and it was thought at one time that Romeo would die. The fever and inflammation ran so high. 
There was a storm when the doctors came home and Bobby told her story. Dr. Fred told his son that he must take his belongings and leave, but the latter refused, saying he had taken the farm for a year, and Cleo intimated that she'd considered herself as mistress then. This proved too much for the elder Wallaces, and Chet was obliged to hire rooms elsewhere, though he continued to manage the farm. Cleo seemed to imagine herself quite an aristocrat when riding out behind the poor, mutilated creatures who had added to their torture the overdraw check rein. We used all to pity them so when we saw them harnessed, heads drawn back until every muscle was strained, unable to see the way over which they must travel, and a prey to flies and gnats. No protection about their heads and ears, for the long mane, intended for both use and beauty by the Creator, was gone and sides, hips, and legs were feasting grounds for stinging, blood-sucking insects, no long tail to switch them off. And then how they looked. The poor things felt their disfigurement as well as their pain. They knew that they looked silly and ridiculous. It was only a little while until they were utterly dispirited and all their style was gone. Between hard driving, the discomfort of being docked, and the ailments induced by the overdraw check, they were old horses at the time they should have been in their prime, and rapidly they changed owners. Before the end of Chet's year on the farm, the list of his cruelties accumulated in what seemed to me to be the most dastardly deed of all. Topsy, despite her hard life, was the faithful standby. On her fell the major part of all the hard work. Two years she had occupied the same stall. Therefore, great was her surprise one evening on being turned loose by the hired man in the yard, as was his custom with her, to find a strange horse in her place. However, the stall was wide, and without making trouble, she took her place beside the intruder and was bending her head to take up a bite of grass from the manger when, with a furious oath, Chet rushed down the alley to the front of the manger and, with a knotted stick, struck her in the face, the first blow half stunning her, the second one tearing the remaining eye from its socket and crushing it on her cheek. There, you old fool, you haven't an eye now, he said with a brutal laugh. Poor Topsy, launched into perpetual darkness. She had said she would be thankful to keep one eye, and now that was gone. All that night she lay moaning in her stall, almost crazed with pain. Master never left her the long hours through. He had Chet arrested and fined $25, but that could not restore Topsy's sight. In less than a month her colt was born, to think I can never see him, she said piteously. Tell me, Dandy, how he looks. The complete loss of sight proved a terrible cross to her. Unlike many horses, she never learned to move with confidence. She was nervous and timid indeed. I think she'd been beaten about the head until her hearing was defective. And then the cruelties that had filled her life had wrought upon her sensitive nature until she was nervous and distrustful. Many a day, and sometimes days at a time, she has gone without water because she could not find the tank. As I am here going to dismiss poor Topsy from my story, I will say that her master soon sold her and her colt. A few times since, I have seen her toiling alongside her mate, her sightless face wearing a blank, worried expression, and always that timid, frightened way with her. Once we had a little talk, and she told me that her life was a misery. She cannot learn to trust herself, as she is only old tops, and no one takes any pains with her. She said her shoulders were all galled under her collar, Despite the bad fortune of her life, though, she has still a slender, graceful form 
and a high-bred air. Poor Topsy. Victim of man's power. End of chapter 17「Eighteen of White Dandy, a Horse's Story, a Companion Book to Black Beauty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. White Dandy, a Horse's Story. A Companion Book to Black Beauty by Velma Caldwell Melville Chapter 18 At the end of that year, Chet and his family went away, and not long after, Master found the coveted place for Carm. It went against him to put the boy on the railroad, and a brakeman's life is none too desirable at best, but nothing else would do, and he had made a fair record at school. Master was going to spend the winter in New York, and I was to be left at home. Tommy went to school in town, and himself and a hired man they called Burr did the work at the farm. I say farm, though the town had grown quite to it, and a long distance along the east side of it. Vainly, people tried to have the firm sell lots, but they said they wanted it all for themselves when they retired, but virtually we lived in town. Tommy was a much worse boy in some respects than either of his brothers. He was underhanded and treacherous, keeping a fair outside to the world, and was counted by many a model youth. His mother regarded him as such, and, in a manner, made Dr. Fred believe the same. But they were destined to a sudden awakening. I suppose parents in general would consider it presumption for an old horse to advise them, but if they had heard as much talk among boys and young men as I have, they might be wiser than they are. At any rate, I shall intimate that the wise parent will make sure whether his son goes to bed to sleep upon returning to his room, or whether it is only to keep still until the house is quiet, and then steal down the back stairs or down the woodshed roof to spend the night in revelry. Mrs. Wallace did not always breakfast with the family, but sometimes when she did I have heard that she noticed Tommy's pallor and worn expression, and chided him for studying so hard. To others she expressed the opinion that the dear child was killing himself by close application, and she feared his mind would prove too much for his body. Bobby would laugh and tell her not to worry, that Tom would never die young on account of his goodness or smartness. Well, it was a shock to me, one night about two o'clock, to hear Tommy's step in the barn and hear him call to Burr in a frightened whisper. Burr, Burr, get up and hide me somewhere. For heaven's sake, hide me, I pray. I have killed a man, and they are after me. Burr, who slept in a little chamber right over my stall, was too dazed to do anything at first, but Tommy's terror was so real that he compelled himself to act. Running down the stairs, he scratched away the straw that concealed a trap door in the floor and bade him crawl in. Then he scattered the straw back and climbed to his own room. He could not have more than reached his bed when hurrying feet and confused angry voices sounded outside. Then somebody opened the door and flashed a lantern into the barn. "'I know that he came home,' said one, "'and I think he headed for the barn.' "'Well, if he is here, we'll have him dead or alive. "'It was a piece of cold-blooded crime, if ever there was one. "'There must have been a dozen of them, and they rushed everywhere. "'Presently, Part went to the house, and the others routed Burr out. "'The latter pretended to be very sleepy and wholly unable to understand what they meant at first. "'He stoutly denied all knowledge of Tom, "'solemnly assuring them that he was not in the barn to his knowledge.' After searching everywhere, as they thought, they found their companions at the house. I suppose that the women folk were terribly frightened. Burr followed to the house, and when he returned, after the searching party had seemed to go away, he told Tommy that his mother just dead fainted away. The doctor was gone for the night. After a while, Tommy said he must go and see his mother and be out of the country before daylight. He started for the house, but never reached it in safety. 
spies were lying in wait to grab him and he was in handcuffs when his mother saw him i wonder if she thought of master's prophetic words of long ago i guess it is about so cruel children make cruel men and if the former are allowed to be cold-blooded and murderous in their little world the latter will likely be in their greater one teach humanity to children is the advice of dandy tommy was put in jail burr said to await trial but somehow broke out and escaped where he is now i don't know but some think his mother does she was quite broken down with grief and shame after that dreadful event and dr fred was bitter against her because she had been so blind and indulgent i am always so driven with business he said but you have plenty of hired help and nothing to do but to look after the children i think the family felt the disgrace keenly and i know that dr fred looked ten years older when master came home than when he went away then there arose another trouble bobby was keeping company with a man of whom her father did not approve the more she was opposed the more persistently she clung to her lover dr fred took her with him a great deal and once when he drove me i heard him entreating her to give the man paul garrett they called him up you are all i have left daughter he said pleadingly and i can't bear to see you throw yourself away on that fellow mamma don't oppose me pouted bobby did she ever oppose any of my children when they were rushing to ruin i wonder he cried bitterly and you are entirely too young to think of marriage yet anyway he added i am willing to do anything for you send you off to school give you music painting anything you name only give up going with or even thinking of that worthless fellow she kept so quiet all the rest of the day that i thought she was convinced and meant to yield obedience at last it could not have been more than a fortnight after that that i was startled one day by a hand on my head and bobby's sweet whispering voice be a good boy dandy and don't make a mite of noise what could it mean i knew burr was away that night and feared that something was wrong silently she put a side saddle on my back and guided me out into the pale starlight keeping well in the shadow of the barn then mounting she directed me down a back lane and through a side gate that stood open though ordinarily it was closed the moment we reached the highway she gave the rein a little twitch saying now do your best dandy we have a long journey before us the air was just keen enough to be bracing and i had had no exercise for two days and this reminds me to say that it is a mistaken kindness that keeps a healthy horse standing without exercise for days or even one day nothing is more tiresome and oft times hurtful if you do not believe it try standing in almost the same attitude yourself for a great many hours lying down occasionally if you can i saw a handsome young horse once with hoofs so abnormally grown and distorted these are master's words from standing for months on a plank floor without exercise that he could not step so nothing averse i went flying over the smooth road until we came up with a dark figure mounted on a chestnut horse oh paul bobby said i've had the loveliest ride and ain't this a romantic elopement elopement i saw all then and wished myself well out of the scrape side by side they galloped on for several hours until i really began to feel jaded by and by bobby said i'll have to slow up dandy's getting tired and i would not hurt him for anything i know uncle dick will forgive me for running away whether the rest do or not but he'd never forgive me if i hurt this dear old dandy i thought her voice trembled a little at the last they went along leisurely for a time after that talking in low tones of their plans for the future suddenly the ringing sound of horses hoofs flying swiftly over the way we had come caused bobby to utter a dismayed cry they're after us nerve yourself for a race the man paul garrett answered and the next moment he cut me with a small riding whip it was wholly unnecessary for i had always loved to obey bobby but off we dashed like the wind at first we distanced our pursuers without difficulty as we were somewhat rested but after a while they seemed to be gaining 
paul cut me often with the whip though i was doing my best and i knew by the chestnut's breathing that he was cruelly spurring it mile after mile we passed until at last just in the gray dawn we were reined up beside a depot platform quickly they dismounted and without even tying us hurried into a train that was pulling out so lucky i heard garrett mutter as they hurried across the platform it could not have been more than three minutes later when two men on jaded horses rode up cursing the luck that the train they had tried so hard to catch was gone it had been no one pursuing the runaway couple after all we the chestnut and i were all of a tremble and dripping with sweat the morning air seemed very cold and we both felt chilly and wretched what can we do said the chestnut that fellow hired me last night saying i would probably be at home to-day but it don't seem possible to go back all that long way without breakfast or water at least but i replied it is the only thing to do we can't make folks understand and if we go wandering around we'll be put in the pound besides i am taking cold and getting stiffer every minute so am i we may as well start at once and we started what a weary weary way it was one of my knees too had been sprained in that last mad race and became momentarily more painful it was long past noon when i limped into our own lane a pair of our horses stood at the gate and a moment later dr fred with a face awful in its stern whiteness came out of the house the horse is ruined he remarked tersely looking me over but i don't know as anything matters much give him the best care and nursing he added to burr the latter was a good hand with horses poor dandy he said i wish you could tell me where you have been and about the little mistress but i could not he gave me a warm mess and while i ate it he rubbed me vigorously with a rough cloth covering me afterward with a blanket for a little while my knee he bandaged with arnica after bathing it a long while with warm water later he gave me water a little hay and a good currying toward night i became feverish but a couple of doses of aconite corrected that my knee has been weak ever since I learned from a conversation between Burr and his brother, who sometimes stayed overnight with him, that Bobby left a note in her room saying that she had borrowed Dandy for a few hours, that she was going away with poor dear Paul. She preferred any hardship with him to life without him, and she hoped Papa would forgive her. Mrs. Wallace assured her husband that it was just what he might have expected when he opposed the match so violently you ought to have remembered too that the girl is all wallace headstrong conceited and quite above being rebuked she has turned out as well as your tommy he answered in a rage and so they relieved themselves by blaming each other instead of kindly sharing their mutual burdens dr fred refused to try to find the girl and the matter was hushed up though burr said every tongue in town was wagging had master been home i think he might have saved bobby when he did come his presence was like a benediction and from that hour dr fred has seemed to lean upon him more than ever burr had been some miles from home of an errand one day when he returned he asked straight away for master he was literally trembling with excitement the moment master came into the barn he burst forth it beats all the horrible dastardly tricks i ever see think of it dr dick roasted a horse alive what what do you mean cried master well i'll try and tell about it though i'm completely cut up you see i was at grinner's seeing about them potatoes when little jim grinner came running in saying that job wells was burning of his balky horse alive grinner and me just lit out for wells's place but about a half mile before we got to his house we came on the awfulest sight eyes ever see there that poor dumb brute stood just moaning with pain but it appeared like he couldn't move and from a dry brush fire kindled right between his fore and hind legs the flames were leaping clean up around his body mercy on us how the hair and flesh smelled i just pulled out my revolver and shot the poor critter dead but i'll never forget the look in his face to my dying day never 
master's indignation can better be imagined than described as he hurriedly ordered a rig and hastened to have the inhuman wretch apprehended there was a big time about it but finally the fellow had to pay a heavy fine master says that balkiness is in truth a disease not a habit that a horse's brain is so constituted that he can have but one idea at a time and that in a state of perfect health and comfort no animal will balk that there is some cause for it if its mind can be diverted it will always start on all right he says there are dozens of simple things that can be resorted to and no harm be done to either man or beast i remember a balky horse that used sometimes to be in the livery barn in the city he said that when quite young he was often overloaded and when he failed to pull they pounded him by and by he said it got so that when loaded even moderately he would get so nervous for fear that he could not pull it and he would be pounded that in spite of himself he would stop and so it came about that the balkiness grew on him another said he used to be balky until his present owner bought him and that it came on him in much the same way as the other described nervousness seemed to paralyze his limbs and all he could think of was that he couldn't go he knew he couldn't and he might as well let them beat him first as last after a while said he this kind man bought me but of course i did not know then that he was kind and the first time he hitched me up i balked i did not want to indeed i was anxious that he should think well of me so anxious that it made me nervous naturally i expected a pounding and when it did not come nor anything else i looked around to see what he was about there that man sat on a stump whittling and presently he began to whistle i concluded i had made some sort of a mistake and while wondering what it all meant my nervousness passed off and when he said kindly well ross are you ready to start I moved off briskly only once or twice since that have i balked at all and then only for a minute master's voice is so kind and encouraging and i know he won't require more of me than i am able to perform burr says he has seen plenty of balky horses started by feeding them an apple or some little thing they particularly liked and i tell you honestly that we horses like dainties as well as anybody master must have spent dollars and dollars for the apples and candy he has fed me in my life another device burr mentioned was lifting up one of the four feet and tapping smartly on the shoe and another buckling a strap tightly about the knee a man he used to work for had a span of balky broncos they kept backing instead of standing perfectly still so he would simply turn them around and they would trot off well pleased of course he could turn back again as soon as he liked he never whipped them kindness and patience will cure the worst case of balking existing harshness only seats the malady more deeply and horses can't help it master and i were some miles from home on one occasion when we heard a sound something like that made by a horsepower threshing machine only sharper and more jerky what is that master asked of the man riding with him a treadmill woodsaw i call it i don't know that that is its name as we came nearer we saw a sort of trap up in the air with a big wheel under it the floor of the trap was quite a marked incline and tied on there were two horses stepping stepping always stepping presently one of them stumbled and went down on her knees struggling all the while to regain her footing several times this was repeated and they both looked so worn and worried the incline of the floor caused them to stand in a humped over and most trying position i am afraid if i were a horse i would quit stepping and let the machine run down said master not after you've had a few lessons the man replied when they cease that motion i have seen them flung clear out of the box i saw one thrown in a regular somersault and so badly injured about the head and neck that it had to be killed master sat in the buggy until the machine stopped how long do you usually run without resting he asked one of the sawyers two hours sometimes and even longer why man it is enough to wear out cast iron horses he cried they do get mighty tired replied the fellow coolly especially old polly here but you see she is stone blind and about wore out anyhow so it's all she's good for and you have no feeling for the dumb brute 
one that has served you well too but just to get what you can out of her do you never feel any pity for her knowing that she is as susceptible to suffering as a human being have you ever tried to put yourself in her place sightless old terrified and weak nah the man answered doggedly she's only an old horse the other man was leading poor polly from the trap now and we could see that her legs trembled and her body was dripping with perspiration there's getting to be a lot of these machines the fellow added as a self-justification so much the worse said master i'll see how such work will stand in law but it seems to me you could save money by putting in a little engine instead of the horsepower one similar to those used on steam threshers only so small that it is arranged on a common pair of bobsleds or on a wagon and easily drawn about the country by two span of horses then all the latter have to do is transport it and you can saw enough more wood to soon pay for your engine the fellow looked interested have you seen one work yes dozens of them and men are getting rich with them one more thing my man master added as he turned to go you will find that the merciful humane man will come out best in the end not only in respect to the life that is to come but in this one be kind to the dumb creatures and then may you hope that a higher power will deal kindly with you as ye measure it shall be measured to you again End of chapter 18、Chapter、Nineteen of White Dandy, A Horse's Story, A Companion Book to Black Beauty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Marie Nachimuli, Canada. White Dandy, a horse's story, a companion book to Black Beauty, by Velma Caldwell Melville, Chapter Nineteen. In speaking of Bobby, Doctor Fred said he thought dime novels and a lack of guidance on her mother's part was what had done the mischief. Then, remembering how he had pled with her to give up Garrett. He would harden again and add, "But she spurned my love, scorned my advice and entreaties, has made her bed, and now she must lie in it." Nay, but master would urge, she is so young, and her mother encouraged the match. And then reading the matter you speak of finding in her room was enough to turn any young undisciplined head. You ought to forgive her, and seek her out the same as you would have done ten years ago, had she run away and got lost in the woods. But Doctor Fred refused. Quietly, Master did his best to find her, but not a clue could he get, and a new turn was given to the thoughts of the household by the sudden death of Carm. Crushed between two cars, the message read, and that was all until a tightly sealed casket came. Better not open it was the advice accompanying. Master and another physician did open it, though. But neither father nor mother were allowed to see the remains. Master came out to the barn with a face white and drawn, and, resting his arm on my neck and his head on them, he sobbed like a grieved child. Oh, Dandy, this is worse than all, worse than all. I wonder if he'll see his mother. Much comfort children bring, judging from my own experience," groaned Doctor Fred at another time. What a failure life is, anyhow. And I thought, yes, it is to men like you, who are trying to steer themselves through the world, and living for self instead of humanity. My master's life is not a failure. A sorry day it was for brute creation when barbed wire was introduced into general use on farms. They put it around our pasture the first we knew of it. One bright morning, John. Jean, Tim, and Ball, a span of young horses, and myself were turned in, and feeling the joyous freedom of unrestrained liberty. And let me tell you, the oldest, most patient horse in the world feels worried and irritated by gearing at times. Away we went for a race, the young ones especially, rearing, kicking, and plunging gaily. Suddenly there was a crash, a frightened neigh of pain. 
a series of groans, and poor jolly Tim recoiled from his violent contact with the fence, blood pouring down his chest and forelegs. Help soon arrived, and Tim was led away, a very different-looking animal, from what he was when he entered. Master washed out the wounds as well as he could, and applied a lotion made of one ounce of calendula to three of soft water. He gave aconite to keep down his fever, and afterwards chinchona as a tonic. And in time Tim was about as jolly as ever, though much more cautious. The next thing that happened was Jean cutting herself on the hip, or rather, just in front of it, where the hip and abdomen join. Master treated her as he had Tim, only he stitched the jagged edges of the wound together. It was in a place where it could not be kept covered successfully, and flies were bad. Besides, Jean continually reached back and worried it with her nose. For this they tied her short, and he made a lotion and very few parts of carbolic acid. Just how many I do not know, but he tested its strength by touching a little to one edge of the sore. The acid, he said, would cleanse it and keep the flies out. She got well, but an unsightly scar remained. Another horse laid his shoulder open, and for some reason it would not heal, and he died of blood poison in spite of all they could do. I fancy that by being careful I was going to escape being impaled on the wretched barbs, but one day, when Mrs. Wallace was driving me, she became frightened at some loose horses and jerked me into a wire fence by the roadside. Well, one needs to be cut on barb wire once to fully appreciate what it means. So, many, many sad cases came to one's notice of horses and other domestic animals that are dragging out a miserable existence, owing to the introduction of this new invention. Sometimes it seems that everything is to the end of making man's life easier and that of the dumb brutes harder. Master had all the barb wire removed from this place long ago, supplying its place either with board, woven wire, or lawn wire fences. But bad as barb wire is, it is nothing to the fad for the overdrawn check rein that is shortening the lives of horses everywhere. Say nothing of the torture they endure while they do live. Why people use it, I cannot imagine, for anyone with half an eye knows that it ruins the looks of a horse. Master says that he, for one, will never presume to improve on the works of the Creator, who is far more artistic than man, and understands the science of beauty perfectly. Many horses have told me, in tones from which all hope seemed gone, for the long hours of inexpressible torture they endure. They say, and I hear it told, that the most eminent veterinarian physicians in the world say the same that the check rein injures a horse from his head to his tail, from his shoulder to his hoof. It brings on disease and deformity. If a horse's neck has not naturally a fine curve, the rein is not going to remedy the matter. Forced curves are not elegant, and the most of the animals I have seen wearing it look like anders when pursuing somebody. Master said it was terrible to witness the mute agony of horses harnessed to fine carriages and sleighs, that he saw while east, and the worst of it is, they generally belong to people who call themselves Christians. Sabbath after Sabbath, men and women kneel in the churches and pray for mercy, while their helpless servants stand without, suffering the extreme of torture. There is no mercy for them. People go about trying to do good, which never a thought of the agony within reach of their hand that they might relieve. Strange that intelligent human beings should imagine for a moment that the continual champing of bits, twitching of the lips, and tossing of the head of an overchecked horse should mean high life. Don't they know that they are the only protests that they can make against the cruel torture that they are enduring, signs of pain, the mute entreaties for mercy? Master says that if some people have it measured to them as they measure unto the helpless, there is a dreadful day coming, and he believes that many a man will make his bed in hell because of his treatment of God's defenseless creatures here. Some young men, caught in a rainstorm, came into our barn for shelter one day, 
and I am going to give a little of their conversation for the benefit of other sportsmen. These had been out hunting. Hi, Billy, but didn't that rabbit cut some antics after I got a pop at him? Yes, why, he didn't seem to know nothing. Just come up and looked a fell right in the face with the blood all trickling down. He died game. You bet. Makes me think of some of us caught in a trap once. Once of its legs was broken, so we cut its throat and let go of it. When you believe the pesky thing lived nigh on half an hour, hopping about on three legs all the time. It was fun to watch it perform. Beats all how long some things hang on, anyhow. I shot Robin one day, just for fun. She fell right on a little tree, and two days after I happened to be passing, and there she lay a gasping yet, and with life enough to flutter a mite when she saw me and give a sort of warning chirp. Looking up, I spied a nest and found four dead birds in it. I loaded as she was a mother and the little ones had starved. I rung the old one's neck, thinking I might as well finish the job. I've shot squirrels and things lots of times, and when I couldn't find them easy, and go off in days after find them still alive, but too weak to get away. Well, it's fun to hunt when game is plenty, but this has been a mighty poor day. I like fishing better. Say, ain't that Kramer a big fool? I went fishing with him one day, and will you believe he would not string a fish till he killed it by running his knife through its spine at the back of its neck? Says a fish that dies ain't fit to eat, and then it, it is inhuman to let anything die by inches. Cranky, ain't he? I should say. Well, I ain't so particular. It's the fun of the thing I'm after, and I don't care two cents for fish to eat. Three years passed, and not one word from Bobby, and her name was seldom mentioned. The life of the farm was quiet and uneventful. The doctors made their rounds of calls, and Mrs. Wallace drove Jean or me out occasionally, and Burr carried on the work. But at last there came a letter to Master which made him look grave and troubled. Often I saw him reading it, or perhaps he got others, but anyway, pondering over a closely written page with a white, anxious face. Dr. Fred, coming quietly into the barn one morning, caught him. What's up? A moment Master hesitated, then made answer. A letter from Bobby. Fred paled and staggered a step. From Bobby, he echoed, then paused. Yes, I have wondered whether any good could come of telling you, but now that it has come about, I will. I have been sending her money for three months past. Garrett misuses her, I think, but she never says so, only... I am heartsick and homesick, Uncle, besides being laid up with neuralgia. Paul is not doing well just now, and Freddy named Frederick Richard for you and dear Papa. Master had read these last lines from the letter, but here Dr. Fred burst out. Where is my baby, my sweet Bobby? So she says, dear Papa, and call the boy Fred. Bring her home to my lonely heart and empty arms, Dick, and I will bless you forever. Of course, I don't know how it all came about, but one morning, some weeks after, Master led me out and set a tiny boy on my back. The little fellow laughed and prattled in an almost unknown tongue. When I got a look at him I saw that he was the picture of Bobby when she was of his age. Presently a white-faced woman, looking as one might imagine Bobby's ghost would, came out and, throwing her arms about my neck, wept violently. "'Dandy, dear old Dandy,' she said. For a while she, her mother and the boy, drove out often with me, but suddenly they stopped, and a few days there was another one of those strange, sad processions where horses wear black plumes. I've seen many such, but this one, the master looking unutterably sad, reminded me of that other one so long ago. Strange that all I love must die, moaned Dr. Fred. And looking into Master's eyes, I saw a look that seemed to say, I might echo the same. But he only bore this trouble as he had all the others, smiling when his heart was sorest, brave when almost despairing, thinking of others before himself. This was Master. 
And so the years have passed along, and I am, as I stood it at first, an old horse. But, thanks to a kind master, I am neither broken down nor dispirited. My teeth are quite bad, but that matters little so long as I am abundantly fed on ground feed. I am growing a little stiff in the legs, but my stall has an earth floor, kept scrupulously clean and dry, and my bedding is fresh and abundant. My eyesight is excellent from having always stood in well-lighted barns, and never having pounded or otherwise injured about the head. My hearing is also perfect, and my lungs good. My feet have been well cared for, excepting in the case mentioned. In short, I believe I am healthier now at thirty-one than are most horses of eighteen. I repeat what I have said before. In substance, a good master makes a good horse, inside and out. If I might gain the ear of a man for an hour, I could surely convince him that inhumanity is the poorest kind of business imaginable, that it is unprofitable for the life that now is, and for the one that is to come. But as I can only stand here and tell my simple story, I will trust that some good angel will waft it far and wide, and that Master's God will impress the little lessons I fain would teach upon the hearts of all readers. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of White Dandy, A Horse's Story, A Companion Book to Black Beauty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. White Dandy, A Horse's Story a Companion Book to Black Beauty by Velma Caldwell Melville Chapter 20 About the tragedy? Well, it was a sad affair, and seemed to me, at the time of its occurrence, the saddest thing that could happen. But I have learned since that sorrow untainted by sin is not the worst thing that comes into life, and that, as Master sometimes quotes, the love that's safe beneath the sod or better still, in the bosom of God, is the perfect love complete. You see, Master and my sweet young mistress, bonny, brown-eyed Annie B., were to be married on the morrow, and a few of the wedding guests were staying at the hospitable old Dean homestead. Railroads were not as plenty then as now, and he was to take her to his home behind the bays. You remember them? I was going, too because I belonged to Annie. We had never been separated more than one whole day in my short life, and she loved me dearly. It is needless to add that I loved her, as only an affectionate dumb creature can love an indulgent owner. You are losing your roses, Annie, with the worry and excitement, her bosom friend, Ray Lyle, said. Let us have an hour in the air. Yes, a horseback ride, agreed my mistress. Only I am such a coward, said her friend. Never mind, you shall ride Dandy. I can manage Jackson. And presently, Master on Julie, another young man on Queen, my mistress on Jackson, a high-spirited creature, and Ray Lyle on my back, were flying over the smooth country roads. I don't know how it happened. No one seemed to, but Jackson suddenly became frightened, reared, and the next moment had flung his fair, sweet rider to the ground. Her head struck sharply against a small boulder by the roadside. Springing from his horse, Dr. Dick was kneeling beside her in a moment, but she lay limp and unconscious. They carried her home. After a time, she opened her pretty eyes and whispered to Master, Keep Dandy, for my sake. After a while she roused again, and smiling up into his stricken face, she said, Meet me. I'll be waiting. She was gone ere the sentence was finished. So you see, Master's wedding is long deferred, but I know what he means when he says, She is waiting, and I am coming. Yes. She laid down the burden of life early, and by and by we will do the same, Master and I. The End
End of chapter 20 An Old Horse's Appeal I'm a poor old gray horse who somebody owns that I'm sadly neglected, you will see by my bones. I wish someone would buy me, I wish I were sold, to a man with a heart, for I'm feeble and old. Every fifth day of the week I come to the mart, and stand teethered and tied to my dirty old cart, while my master in ease at the public house table denies me shelter and food and stable. I'm possessed of some virtues which in him you'll not find. I am docile and patient, I am gentle and kind. My acts are instinctive, his the proof of a mind. But if I've no reason, he is certainly blind. I know tis his haste to accumulate pelf. I know tis the thought of his miserable self. I know tis his love and grasp after greed that makes him forget he's a christian in creed i am tied with no shelter for hours together no matter the wind no matter the weather you may judge how i suffer think of my pain for i am cold i am sodden i am dripping with rain sometimes in the snow sometimes in the sleet you may see me uncared for exposed in the street without water to drink without morsel to eat I stand close to the hall where the magistrates meet. I am equally close to the justice's seat. But because I've no wound on my body or head, I may stand till I'm stunned, I may stand till I'm dead. O oh, friends of humanity, friends of the brute, bestow on me pity, though by nature I'm mute. I'm a creature of God, deny it who can, and have feelings as keen and as strong as a man. End of White Dandy, A Horse's Story, A Companion Book to Black Beauty, by Velma Caldwell Melville. Recording by Prachi Pensee, Wilmington, Delaware.